Majority Report with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> Ever get the feeling you've been cheated? It is Wednesday, October 21st, 2020. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Brian Fallon, co-founder, executive director of Demand Justice. On the Supreme Court, yesterday, today, and tomorrow, metaphorically. Meanwhile, parents of nearly 550 immigrant children kidnapped by U.S. Customs officers cannot be located. And as hospitalizations increase in 37 states, the coronavirus pandemic has caused 300,000 excess deaths this year. So far, Mitch McConnell increasingly concerned that Nancy Pelosi in the White House may strike a coronavirus stimulus or relief deal. Meanwhile, the White House wants to cut coronavirus and other health service funds to Democratic-led cities, uh, so-called anarchist cities. Betsy DeVos says the Department of Education has no role in tracking coronavirus in schools. The OxyContin maker, Purdue Pharma, will plead guilty to three criminal charges. Amy Coney Barrett apparently was a trustee at a school that barred children of gay parents as well as discouraging LGBTQ teachers. Texas can reject ballots for non-matching signatures with no review process. Alarm bells ringing over Karl Rove's White House push to fast track a 5G spectrum contract. And lastly, half of Trump supporters think top Democrats are, of course, involved in a major child tra- sex trafficking ring. All this and more on today's program. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Uh, we are now less than two weeks out from the election day as we have been calling it for years. However, of course, people are voting now. We have record numbers of early voting that is happening across the country in varying states. Um, Really impossible to know whether these are indications of increased turnout we will have higher numbers of people who will actually be participating in this election, uh, or it's we have higher numbers of people who are participating in this election early. In other words, these are people who would have voted on election day in a normal year, but because of coronavirus and mail-in balloting and concerns about people's ballots being counted, they're voting early. So we really can't know. There are, you know, hints and shades here and there, but um, nothing that is particularly definitive. You know, people are looking at the genders of ballots that are coming in. 2018, we saw a surge of women in uh, coming out and voting for Democrats. So if you see a similar, I guess, uh, increase in women's ballots coming in 
that may be indicative of a big Democratic win two weeks from now or whenever we find out what the results are. They, we could find out the results in two weeks from yesterday. We could uh, find out the results days later, weeks later. We shall see. Um, there's also things like um, there's some polling that we've been uh, seeing, or I should say reading about, that not really available to the public, but on a district level, I think Greg Sargent um, uh, did an interview with uh, a pollster about that in the Washington Post. And on the district level, where you can see more granular uh, breakdowns of, of who's coming out to vote, the district level polling, specific districts around the country, um, look good for Democrats. Uh, but again, it's really difficult to tell. It's really difficult to tell. Uh, so folks should get out and vote and um, and have patience. I feel like we're all sitting around with bated breath on some level, but um, what can you do? Meanwhile, Donald Trump is um, has been on tour. Uh, as you know, he went to uh, Pennsylvania, which is going to be a a key state. It is a um, it is one that uh, Hillary Clinton lost by forty thousand votes or so in twenty sixteen, and uh, it is one that there are ways of Joe Biden winning if he doesn't take Pennsylvania, but um, it gets a little bit complicated, and uh, so uh, this Pennsylvania is going to get a lot of attention. I think uh, former President Obama is going to be visiting Pennsylvania soon. Uh, here is Donald Trump in Erie, Pennsylvania. I'm not sure this is the best pitch for Erie, Pennsylvania, but uh, here it is. Four or five months ago when we started this whole thing, I, because, you know, before the plague came in, I had it made. I wasn't coming to Erie. I, I mean, I have to be honest. There's no way I was coming. I didn't have to. I would have called you and said, hey, Erie, you know, if you have a chance, get out. But we had this thing won. We were so far up. We had the greatest economy ever, greatest jobs, greatest everything. And then we got hit with the plague. And I had to go back to work. Hello, Erie. May I please have your vote? <laughs> right? I love Erie. No, hey, we had a big deal in Erie. We had a big deal in Erie, right? This was not supposed to be a Trump thing. It's, a lot of Democrats, but they're Democrats that love Trump because I love them. And you know what? You're workers. You're like, we, we work, we work, we work. But that was a pretty big upset, wasn't it, huh? Uh, he's a little bit lost. Um, I mean, there is a, there's a quality of a road comic uh, where it's like, oh, I can't believe I'm in this dump. <laughs> where I remember uh, stand-ups going into like um, Chinese restaurants that they had built a stage to do uh, some comedy. And the first thing they do is they spend the first five minutes dumping on the place. Um, I don't know, maybe that'll be effective. The audience didn't seem to be terribly excited at the fact that he really didn't want to be there. Trump also made an early exit. I don't know if that's a common thing with uh, road comics either, but he complained about the weather being too cold. It was 50 degrees. And, he, and so he left the stage. Mm -hmm. Interesting. He also walked out of this uh, Leslie Stahl uh, interview. Do we know what question she asked that got him so upset? Or was he just, uh, was that just like uh, for effect? No idea, right? Is that it? I, I think this is a strategy of theirs. To, ah. you know, give the media a hard time. Well, um, uh, maybe that'll, that'll work. Um, should also, um, here is, um, let's talk about, uh, for just a moment, Mitch McConnell on the floor of the Senate yesterday. Um, McConnell is, I think, a little bit concerned that the White House is going to capitulate to some of Nancy Pelosi's demands in terms of a coronavirus stimulus or relief bill. It's interesting because we're calling it a relief bill. And of course, if you recall, it's a while back in the wake of the financial crisis, called it a stimulus bill. 
These are the same things. Uh, but one is considered relief, I guess, when you have a Republican president and when you have a Democratic president, it's stimulus. Uh, the idea being that one relieves the pain. The other is it's a proactive government is getting too involved in things. Nevertheless, here is Mitch McConnell um, saying that there is bipartisan support, but not for things like Oh, support for cities and states and for testing of uh, coronavirus, et cetera, et cetera. He is concerned, I think, uh, that it will put his caucus in a tough position if the White House agrees to say a $2 trillion package uh, because they have been preening about things like the deficit, although they have, of course, been racking up the deficit. And, uh, but they also don't want to go out there and vote against helping people. Here's Mitch McConnell on the Senate floor yesterday. Well, but there's a problem. The PPP has been taken hostage, just like the funding for safe schools, more funding for testing, more funding for vaccines, more funding for federal unemployment benefits, and common sense legal protections that charities and university presidents have been pleading for. The PPP has been taken hostage by Speaker Pelosi and leader Schumer. The Democratic leaders have spent months holding out for a long, far-left wish list of non-COVID-related priorities and obstructing any additional aid until they get it. All or nothing. All or nothing. That's been their position. Either Democrats get every unrelated policy they want or American families get nothing. So for months, they blocked bipartisan aid at every single turn. The Democratic leader even tried last night to adjourn the Senate so we could do nothing at all for three weeks. Nothing at all for three weeks. That's how urgent he thinks it is to help working people. He wanted to go home for three weeks because President Trump will not just cave to the entire Democratic Party platform because, for example, the president won't simply hand out endless sums of cash to chronically mismanaged state and city governments out of proportion to COVID needs. That's, that's McConnell trying to uh, convince uh, Donald Trump that it's in his best interest to deny uh, coronavirus-related aid to potential voters. McConnell's very afraid that, that, that Donald Trump's going to realize um, that he should, he should. I mean, he keeps claiming he's going to go bigger than uh, Nancy Pelosi. He should. He should double it for that matter. Uh, but Mitch McConnell would be terrified if that was to happen. And so uh, that's the pitch there from Mitch McConnell. Don't do anything, Mr. President. Uh, much better to do that. I don't know why he kept saying three weeks too, because I don't, I don't think you're going to adjourn for uh, till the, um, the election, but I'm not sure what that was about as opposed to two weeks. But I guess it's trying to make it seem like it's much more dramatic. Um, we're going to take a, uh, just a break here. Um, and then when we come back, we're going to be talking to Brian Fallon, the executive director of Demand Justice, um, about that concern and about the reasons why Chuck Schumer tried to adjourn the Senate so that uh, hearings, or I should say votes on Amy Coney Barrett uh, could not take place at least before the election. Just a reminder, uh, this program relies on your support. Uh, you can become a member and support the program at join the majority report, uh, join the majority report .com. And uh, when you do, you not only support the free show, you get extra content in the uh, fun half, as we call it. And so um, we appreciate any support you can give the program, join the majority report .com. Also, uh, don't forget to check out uh, the No McKee Show. No Me Key Show. Uh, you can find it at youtube.com slash the Nomi Key Show. I'm not sure who's going to be on the program today, but she's been having some great panels as of late. So uh, make sure you check that out. All right. Um, let's start. Uh, we're going to bring um, a Brian Fallon in. Um, and, but before we do, let's start with this clip. Um, this is uh, number 13. And uh, maybe we should bring uh, uh, Brian on just so he can see this as well. Let's play this clip, Brendan. 
Do we have 13? Hearings. Hmm? The Barrett hearings? Sure, go ahead. Um, some progressive groups have spoken out criticizing Senator Feinstein for her handling of the hearings. I was wondering what you make of this criticism and do you plan to make any changes to the Judiciary Committee? Okay, I've had a long and serious talk with Senator Feinstein. That's all I'm going to say about it right now. Okay, nope. All right, well, now it's time for us to have a long and serious talk uh, with Brian Fallon. He is the executive director of Demand Justice. Uh, and uh, the co-founder, uh, former uh, Obama administration uh, official. Uh, Brian, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me back on. Nice to be with you. Uh, now, Brian, I should also say disclosure, uh, and you may not even be aware of this, but Demand Justice did at one point um, uh, advertise on our audio podcast. So, uh, and I should also say, um, it was, I think it was just one time. I'm not, uh, that, that was, that was plenty, but, uh, let me also just say it was one of the rare occasions where I've actually seen like on the list of who's going to advertise and was genuinely excited. Uh, I'm a big fan of, of your organization and let's, uh, before we get into sort of like what's going on right now, um, uh, let's just talk a little bit about the, um, the genesis of, of, of what uh, Demand Progress is about. Um, wh wh why did you start this organization? What, what, it, what is its purpose? Um, it was started by myself and my co-founder, Chris Kang. Um, both Chris and I worked in the Senate for, in my case, six years, in his case, seven. I worked for Chuck Schumer um, as his director of communications. Chris worked for Senator Durbin as his um, floor, uh, floor guy and chief counsel. Um, we both then went to work in the Obama administration. I worked at DOJ as the director of public affairs. Chris worked as the deputy White House counsel in charge of judicial nominations. Um, and we started this group in 2018 um, in answer to the Trump-McConnell project of relentlessly confirming these far right wing, very young, in many cases, unqualified for the federal bench judicial nominees that are going to outlive Trump's time in office by several decades and are going to be an existential threat and barrier to any progressive uh, goals and legislation that we seek to advance in, in a potential Biden administration and for years beyond that. Um, but, but we're really trying to tackle something that is sort of a several decades old problem, which is the asymmetry between the far right and the political left in terms of how much it centers and organizes around the courts. The conservatives have for a long time now realized that their overall vision of society is unpopular and hard to win elections by running on, and it's hard to legislate on their agenda. Um, and so they figured out that the courts would be a place where they could do an end run around the duly elected branches of government um, so that even if they couldn't repeal ACA through the normal means, uh, even if they couldn't legislate some kind of abortion ban, uh, even if gun safety provisions were highly popular with the public, they could get their way on all those types of issues and more by controlling the courts. And Mitch McConnell has said openly that their goal in confirming so many judicial nominees for Trump is to, quote, quote unquote, move the country to the right. And increasingly, we're seeing that the courts are the vessel by which they not only intend to advance their policy agenda, but also the way that they intend to entrench their own political power in terms of we're seeing a very consistent set of rulings from the Roberts court in, uh, in favor of voter suppression schemes that are interfering with the ability to um, ensure that people can vote during COVID in this election cycle, but you know, it predates this election cycle. If you go back to Citizens United, if you go back to the Shelby County decision, you know, our point to Democrats is not only is our policy agenda at risk based on these judges that Trump and McConnell are confirming, but our ability to win free and fair elections in the future is fundamentally undermined unless we get in the ball game and start contesting this battle for the third branch of government. So we're right now in the throes of contesting this Amy Coney Barrett nomination, but we're here for the long haul to try to get progressives to organize around the courts and view that as the political branch it is that needs attention and needs political organizing. And what, 
one of the things that was indicative of that asymmetry was the number of, of vacancies that were left um, uh, after the Obama administration. Now, part of that obviously was extreme obstruction by uh, the Republicans in a way that we had never seen before. But part of that was also um, a, and, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, a, a failure of the Obama administration to prioritize having, you know, judges there to nominate in a way that the right does. So they just basically have a Gatling gun of, of judges to put up uh, one after another. And the other was a failure of, of, of Democrats in the Senate to understand what really to sort of like appreciate the, the, the context that was going on. I mean, I'm thinking in terms of, of, of Pat Leahy and his, um, uh, his upholding blue slips, which is now a quaint tradition. But we hear things from Democrats that we're, we're going to bring those back. Like, I mean, I, you know, so I, I mean, speak to the, that, um, that lack of awareness and, and then what your organization is doing to counteract that, both in terms of like, theorizing a, a Biden administration and theorizing a, uh, a, a Senate controlled by the Democrats. So you're absolutely right. Um, on the day that Donald Trump was sworn into office, he inherited over 100 vacancies. Um, so part of his ability to set so many records in terms of the sheer number of judges he's confirming is in part because he inherited so many vacancies. Um, the last two years of Barack Obama's presidency, he obviously had a Republican Senate led by Mitch McConnell. And so Mitch McConnell deserves a bulk of the blame for so many vacancies being left to Donald Trump to fill because Mitch McConnell basically um, did not grant votes for Barack Obama's judicial nominees in the last two years. But for the six years of Barack Obama's presidency prior to that, before the Senate flipped in 2014, uh, Patrick Leahy was in charge of the Senate Judiciary Committee. And there were a whole bunch of vacancies that lasted for those six years because of Senate Democrats' posture, led by Patrick Leahy, that they would only advance Barack Obama's nominees if Senate Republicans went along. And specifically, Patrick Leahy had a vision of this so-called blue slip rule, which is a Senate tradition that Patrick Leahy chose to interpret in its most extreme form, which is to say that if Barack Obama wanted to nominate a judge, to a federal appeals court in a particular region that uh, happened to have two Republican senators representing that state, or even just one Republican senator representing that state. Patrick Leahy made it a rule that he would not move that nominee out of committee unless both of those home state senators signed off on the pick. And so even in states where like Wisconsin, where Tammy Baldwin was there, if the if Ron Johnson was not going along with the pick as well, Patrick Leahy wouldn't move it. Uh, and so as a result, there were all kinds of nominees that Barack Obama put forward that never even got a vote on the Senate floor during the time when Senate Democrats controlled the chamber, because Patrick Leahy was so solicitous of what Republicans wanted for those seats in those states that where they happened to have a, a Republican senator. Flash forward to 2017, Donald Trump is in the White House, Mitch McConnell's in charge of the Senate, and all of a sudden they want to fill those very same vacancies that Patrick Leahy was unwilling to fill unless he got, you know, consent from his Republican colleagues. The Republicans decide, screw this, we're not going to let Al Franken in Minnesota have, have a say over who gets nominated from Minnesota. We, we want to jam this Federalist Society guy through David Strauss. And it began with uh, it began with nominees in Minnesota and Wisconsin. First, they decided to go against Al Franken's blue slip. Then they went against Tammy Baldwin's blue slip. And then you have the, the, the now top Democrat on the committee is Dianne Feinstein. She represents California, obviously. California is at the heart of the ninth district of the Court of Appeals, which is sort of the liberal, the most progressive circuit court in the United States of America. It's where a lot of challenges to Trump administration policies have been filed because the ninth circuit is considered friendlier to um, issues like LBG, LGBTQ equality, immigration policies. There's been three seats out of California on the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals that 
if the old rules were in place, Dianne Feinstein should have been able to have a veto over who filled those seats. The Trump administration said, screw you. Uh, you are the top Democrat on the committee. We are not even going to show you the least bit of deference on these three seats in California. And Mitch McConnell and Donald Trump jammed through three federal society hardliners over the objection of the soon to be vice president of the United States and the, the, the Judiciary Committee senior most Democrat. And all we've been saying in the aftermath of that to Diane Feinstein is, hey, they totally disrespected you in this process. They, they have larded up the judiciary with their people in your own backyard. The least you can do is tell us that if we as progressives work so hard to help flip the Senate and put you in control of this process in 2021 with Joe Biden as president, that you will do unto them what they have done unto us and that you won't let, say, Ted Cruz have veto power over who Joe Biden can appoint to a federal judge position in Texas. And Dianne Feinstein will not say that. Dianne Feinstein is holding open the possibility of wanting to work across the aisle with Republicans and, and return to the policy of Patrick Leahy that created all these vacancies for Trump to fill in the first place. It's asinine. I, I mean, what? You, you spent six years in the Senate. I mean, and, and, and I, I, this is one of the things I think that people cannot un, even like wrap their heads around. It's, you know, I mean, and, and I don't know if you the, the, the pitch was literally like, hey, they disrespected you. Um, why are you often? Because it's also like it's not just really ultimately about disrespecting this one individual. I mean, this is what it seems like the Senate is about, though. It's Patrick Leahy or uh, or Dianne Feinstein or at one point, Chris Coons, you know, maybe a year ago was saying, like, we, we should bring back the filibuster for judges if we take the Senate. In other words, we should give the keys back to the Republicans if we if we own the car, essentially. And it is they seem to be I mean, to normal people, to activists, to anybody who's not a senator, it seems insane that this is about like, hey, you know, my colleague at work, like I've decided I'm going to uh, I'm going to be washing all the coffee mugs for everybody. Th that's not what's going on here. Right. This is like. Decades of, 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 I mean, we're, we could be talking about the destruction of the administrative state. We could be talking about uh, sovereignty over uh, women's bodies. We could be talking about uh, marriage equality. I mean, on and on and on and on. And for them, it is really just a function of like, you know, I decided to give up the first parking spot because I just want to show that I'm a good, good person here. I mean, that, that's what it feels like. Um. I have a friend in um, the progressive movement named Jeff Hauser, who runs a project called the Revolving Door Project, which um, tries to advocate against excessive corporate influence in federal appointments. Um, and uh, he has a term called learned helplessness. Yes. And uh, I think just that's just so apt. It's it's uh, as we have a proclivity on the Democratic side to um, be constantly prioritizing these very quaint notions of civility and decorum uh, while the other side is obliterating every possible norm. And uh, so we have this asymmetrical warfare being carried out on the floor of the United States Senate. And it was sort of typified again last week at the hearings where, you know, Lindsey Graham, it was outrageous that they were even holding hearings prior to the election um, to jam this nomination of Amy Coney Barrett through. And there was all kinds of pressure from the outside on Senate Democrats to grind the Senate to a halt, pull out every stop that you can use, every procedural tool in your arsenal to try to slow this process down. And uh, Senate Democrats have been responding to that by saying, like, we, we are going to do everything we can. You just have to understand that, you know, our, 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 we have very few, you know, tools at our disposal to actually slow it down. But we're with you 100 percent. In terms of the sentiment, we think this is illegitimate. We want to slow everything down. And then on the last day of the hearing, uh, Senator Feinstein is applauding Lindsey Graham for running such a, um, a, uh, uh, a civil and fair hearing instead of lambasting the pro process as illegitimate. And so if we can't even be consistent and disciplined about calling this sham process to jam this nominee through before the election a sham. If we're like giving in to the hostage takers, even in this scenario, which to me, 
everything's on the line. It's the, the outpouring of donations after Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed away, you know, was a reminder of just how intensely personal this fight is for a lot of progressives, that this is the Ruth Bader Ginsburg seat. The Republicans are pulling off their second theft of a Supreme Court seat in four years. You would think that if anything could get the passions going, if anything could get the Democrats to meet the moment and play, you know, um, play for keeps, that this would be the moment. And we still see this instinct to retreat and to turn the other cheek as the Republicans constantly get the better of us. So I think it's a generational thing. I think that there's a lot of Democrats that are newly elected that only know Congress and the Senate as a dysfunctional body, and they want to change things. And some, But some of the folks of an earlier generation that um, uh, still think that they're operating in the Senate of 30 years ago um, my, so my hope is that in time, some of these younger members that have become that have only known frustration and their time in Washington, uh, that there's a little bit more sense of urgency on their part to change things. And I think that's why there's a bit of a caucus rebellion to oust Dianne Feinstein from that position. I, you're seeing a lot of junior members talk openly about getting rid of the filibuster. So I think it's somewhat generational. It's just frustrating that it's taking this long. Right. To get the census. I mean... Uh, with six three, I don't know. Will Democrats be allowed to even uh, have new members of Congress? I'm being a little facetious, but uh, all right. Well, so let me ask you this: I mean, do you think that they should have, or um, do you think that? Uh, I mean, I guess it's a little bit um, uh, spilt milk at this point uh, to ask whether they should have um, uh, even even attended those hearings, frankly. Uh, I, I mean, a ret- I, mean I, I certainly at the time thought they should have boycotted. It's very hard to make the argument that this is a sham, but let me participate because as soon as they do, it's, it seems like every other hearing that has ever happened. And in fact, by the end, it turned out to be one that was, you know, all about Senate comedy. Um, but what do you think uh, and, uh, you know, I know you may probably still have some friends in the office, but do you think that Chuck Schumer is doing enough to slow the process? And simultaneously, what do you think about the theory that if um, there is a, a cohort of, of Democrats, it may be generational, that are looking to reform the Supreme Court, whether that involves term limits, whether it involves uh, expanding its size, they would have a better basis in which to do it if the vote on Amy Coney Barrett had to take place after the election when everybody was in lame duck. So first of all, I don't think it's, um, you know, crying over spilt milk to say that I I do think they should have boycotted the hearings. We said that at the time, you know, the, the, the senators, and this part is not generational. This, this was, this was a fairly common sentiment that we encountered as we were trying to propose to them that boycott the hearings. Um, um, even the, even some of the junior members of the committee that are usually pretty good um, all thought that there were more points to be scored by uh, confronting her with her record, asking her questions. And, you know, these Supreme Court hearings are a joke in general. Like the, 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 by the time they get elevated to the Supreme Court, these nominees are very practiced in the art of studiously avoiding answering any questions. It's, and to be frank, you know, the, the intellectual caliber of some of these people that get nominated for the court, um, they're better at evading questions than the senators are at asking them. So I was one of the people that thought that there was, it, her record was very damning as it was before going into the hearing. There were very, very little upside to be had by participating in a sham process. And I thought that the air of legitimacy would have completely been taken away if the Democrats just decided in mass that we're not going to participate in the hearings. You've actually seen in some polling since the hearings concluded that support for among rank and file uh, registered Democrats for her nomination is up yeah. because I think amongst people that are only paying casual attention to this when all the sort of formalities of the process are being carried out, it, she, it confers an air of legitimacy on her. And I think that it would have, uh, it would have gone over uh, far differently if the Democrats just removed themselves from the process in the way that the Republicans did when they decided that they weren't going to consider the Merrick Garland nomination. I, I agree. Mean, I, I think look to how they handled it four years ago to see what we should have, what playbook we could have carried out this time. It's a classic case of 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 show don't tell. If you're if you're all standing outside the committee uh, hearing, you, nobody has to listen to the words you're saying. They just know that you're not going in there for some reason, and there's a problem. Uh, but so. so do you think that there is that that Chuck Schumer has um, arrows in his quiver 
that he is willing to use or is he deployed any of those at this point to maybe push the vote if you and and i'd like your your response too to that theory that you know doing this in the lame duck increases the outrage uh that could lead to maybe um you know uh, incentivizing some reform later do you think yeah from the beginning we have said um uh internally and to other allied organizations and to senate offices that like uh look we know that um <clears throat> they have the votes, but let's just set uh, a goal for ourselves in the short term of seeing if we can get this past the election, because depending on the results of the election, it may completely change the complexion of this whole thing and their willingness to go forward if they've just lost the, the, the 2020 elections might change their outlook. Um, I think that Schumer, Schumer is, you know, uh, handled this, I, th- I think, in, a, in, a, in an interesting fashion. Schumer personally has actually been quite good, I think. Uh, his outreach has been pretty constant to progressive groups. You know, a lot of the big progressive movement organizations have big centers of gravity in New York City. And so if you look at organizations like Center for Popular Democracy, if you look at Indivisible, um, if you look at Working Families Party, a lot of them are sort of um, centered in New York City. And over the last four years, a lot of their affiliates for those organizations have spent a lot of time protesting outside Chuck Schumer's Park Slope apartment in Brooklyn. Um, and he has taken notice of those groups. I think he's doing weekly calls with all those organizations on a personal basis himself it, throughout uh, this whole five weeks now since RBG passed away. So his, he, you know, he's in cycle in 2022. He has seen, uh, he has seen Elliot Engel lose his seat. He's seen Crowley lose his seat. And I don't think Schumer is in danger of losing statewide um, in a primary challenge in 2022. But I think he is well aware of the optics of how weak it would make him look if he had a formidable challenger from the left that a lot of these organizations got behind. And so I think being the good politician he is, he is trying to be responsive to those organizations, especially the ones that have a center of gravity in his home state. And so one of the consistent refrains from the from our coalition, including those groups that I mentioned, has been use every tool in your disposal in the Senate. I think that they are making an honest effort on on that. They have done things like invoke the two hour rule that shuts down hearings during days when the Senate's in session. Um, They have had motions to adjourn um, that have failed because McConnell's had the votes. Um, They're doing quorum calls, there's supposed to be one today that requires the Senate to scramble all their members to get, uh, so that all the Republicans are on the floor if they wanna proceed with Senate business. Um, they, They did craftily pull off a maneuver where McConnell was sort of caught sleeping and Chuck filed cloture on a bill, which is very rare for anybody other than the majority leader to do, which sucked up two and a half days voting on an ACA related measure and put all the Republicans on the record about the ACA lawsuit that Trump's bringing. They've said publicly that they will boycott the markup hearing on Thursday and force the Republicans to either provide a quorum themselves to advance that nomination or change the rules of the committee in order to do so. So um, there's some things that people have asked that they've um, that so far they haven't done, like um, like there was a letter sent yesterday signed by 20 different groups asking Pelosi to send an impeachment resolution on Bill Barr over to the Senate, which would force McConnell to have to consider it. Um, but that's something that would have to originate in the House and the Senate procedural experts tell us that at most, you know, McConnell would probably only spend one legislative day on that. Um, but if you look at other, if you look at other sort of like what have been like litmus test moments in terms of testing the resolve of the Democrats, uh, one of the other things that we asked of the Democrats was don't take courtesy meetings. One of the usual traditions is that after a nominee is named, they go up to the Hill and they do um, courtesy meetings where, you know, for 45 minutes to an hour, they talk about their views. And it's a charade where photo ops happen. And that also confers an air of legitimacy. Seven of the 10 Democrats on the committee took meetings with the nominee, which made me want to pull my hair out. Schumer um, said he wouldn't meet with uh, Amy Coney Barrett, and he's held to that. Um, And then when it comes to the idea of adding seats, Schumer's answer has been probably the best um, of anyone in the caucus other than Ed Markey. Ed Markey has actually come out and said that he's for adding seats if the Republicans go through this. Schumer has said everything's on the table. Um, uh, And so on most of the questions, I think Schumer in his personal capacity has been quite good. Where the frustrations come in is that um, I think people 
sometimes hope that Schumer as leader will sort of drag the caucus along so that it, you know, not just Chuck refusing to meet with the nominee, but Chuck telling the other 46 Democrats to also boycott those meetings. Schumer is not that kind. He doesn't view the majority, the minority leader position in that way in terms of he's, he's, he's frequently will tell outside groups that uh, lobby him that, he can control what he does. He can make recommendations to the rest of the caucus, but he can't dictate terms to the rest of the caucus. And so I think that there's still some frustration in some corners of the progressive movement because a lot of them wish he would be a little bit more heavy handed, like um, but he, that's not how he approaches the job. He would lead a little more. I mean, he's looking at the entire Senate caucus, it seems to me, like the Baileys. Uh, his uh, famed family from Long Island. And as long as he provides services for them, he thinks he's doing their job. Uh, he's doing his job. But as leader, he's supposed to be basically, you know, whipping uh, people and leading a strategy as opposed to providing, you know, constituent services uh, for the other senators. And I think that's, you know, as far as I can tell, that's the that's the issue. I mean, I, I, you know, I think he's He's doing a good job of making sure that he re remains uh, Senate um, minority leader and maybe majority leader and also a senator from New York. But that's not necessarily sometimes you have to expend some of that capital to be a leader, it seems. And if we needed it, it would it would be now. So let me ask you this in um, let's for a moment assume that the Democrats take the Senate. Uh, Joe Biden takes uh, the White House. These are big assumptions. <laughs> we have a long way to go to get there. But um, what is happening in terms of and like I know that uh, when you're uh, when you when you guys launched the organization, you talked about um, having no corporate lawyers as uh, potential judicial uh, nominees uh, for federal judgeships and for for Supreme Court justice uh, seats. Um, what is going on now? to that is analogous to um i guess the heritage foundation giving and the federalist society giving uh donald trump a list like where what is can to the extent that you can talk about this because obviously there's a lot of inside stuff that's happening now how is that going so i'd say a few things on that um uh yeah our position is that um, in addition to hopefully expanding the number of judicial seats uh, uh, across the across the federal judiciary, uh, we'd like to change the sort of paradigm for who uh, a Joe Biden seeks to nominate. And in general, we want those people to be younger than previous appointees of Democratic presidents, and we want them to have different professional backgrounds. Um, we, we want them to be racially uh, diverse and diverse from a gender standpoint as well. That goes without saying. But we also want them to bring professional diversity to the table so that instead of having a default that is set by sort of what's um, what would meet with the approval of Senate Republicans, you know, we've become conditioned to nominate people that we think l l could get 60 votes in the Senate and attract the support of somebody like Lindsey Graham. So who do we typically nominate? We nominate federal prosecutors so that there's a tough law and order uh, image about them. And we nominate corporate lawyers that work for white shoe firms representing big pharma and the energy sector and big banks um, so that they're seen as like pro-business Democrats. And we'd like to turn that on its head and we'd like to attach, you know, some prestige and um, put a premium on nominating public defenders instead of more prosecutors and nominating labor lawyers and civil rights lawyers instead of corporate lawyers um, and act like those pedigrees are just as distinguished and just as qualified for the bench. So we've been doing a few things on that front. Um, uh, earlier this year, we worked with Matt Brunig at the People's Policy Project to do a comprehensive analysis of the judicial selection committees that most senators rely on. Um, to make recommendations to them for people for uh, open slots in the judiciary. So usually what happens for these judges, it's a very opaque uh, process that is unknown um, to a lot of rank and file progressive lawyers that might like to be judges, but have no idea about how to go about raising their hand or get considered. Most of what happens is a lot of these senators appoint um, selection committees that vet candidates for them and make recommendations to them so that they in turn can recommend somebody to the White House. And if you look at the composition of these selection committees, who does it tend to be? People that donate to their campaigns that are, are themselves corporate lawyers and former prosecutors. So it's no surprise that the types of people that end up getting nominated are the professional colleagues of the people that serve on these selection committees. And so they come from the same lines of work. 
what we are trying to do is sort of put a microscope on these selection committees. Only about half of the senators even disclose who's on them. The rest of them keep the process entirely opaque and don't acknowledge who are the members of those committees. We're launching pressure campaigns to try to force Democrats that don't disclose who's on their membership committees to do so. And in the cases where they do disclose it, highlighting the lack of proportionality in terms of the types of people that are on there. And our ideal solution would be that a Joe Biden would come in and completely just end this practice of so excessively deferring to senators to come up with recommendations for these positions. If you look back to the 1970s, Jimmy Carter created independent presidential level commissions so that people could nominate or suggest names to him that he would then in turn nominate. Uh, he, he tried to you know, take it a little bit out of the Senate. You have so much patronage and donor back scratching that happens when, it, when it's all going through the, the pipeline controlled by the senators that it's just rife with abuse and, and cronyism. Um, but in the meantime, we would at least like to blow up and make a huge liability out of the tilted composition of these selection committees. Um, there's a bunch of groups on the left that have been, including ourselves, that have been collecting names um, for the last couple of years. And the Biden transition project is already stood up. So even though the campaign is still being carried out, there is a um, taxpayer funded transition project that exists that is fully staffed that includes people that are vetting potential judicial candidates and we're making recommendations to them and the people that we are putting our muscle behind are people that are younger and people that come from those diverse professional backgrounds and there's reason to believe that the Biden administration is going to have an improved outlook on this question. In the platform that was adopted at the virtual convention this past summer, there was explicit language calling for priority status to be assigned to public defenders, labor lawyers, um, civil rights lawyers. That was specifically contemplated in the platform. And the, according to the reports that are out this week from Bloomberg News, among others, the leading candidate to be Joe Biden's chief of staff is a guy named Ron Klain, who is known to a lot of people in the judicial issue space because he's a former, um, he was the Sherpa for Ruth Bader Ginsburg working in the White House Counsel's Office under President Clinton when RBG was nominated. He's um, a long time, uh, uh, a long time involved in American Constitution Society, one of the big progressive legal groups. And Ron gets this as well as anybody in terms of the need to skew younger and to diversify the federal bench. So I think in Ron Klain, we'll have a partner inside the Biden White House in terms of making this a priority. You know, and we just have a, a couple minutes here, but um, the ACS is an organization that Russ Feingold now, uh, I think is the president of, I think that's the title he has. And it was uh, in many respects, at least uh, contemplated as some type of um, a ballast against the Federalist Society. But it feels like during the Obama administration that the ACS it never got lift off. And in some ways it became, I mean, with the Federalist Society, that's the only imprimatur you need if you're on the right. And the, and, and it creates a, almost like a, some type of corporate structure where you move up the ranks in there and, and, and people sort of, there's cranes in there and they lift you and it, and it gets you in front of the right people. The ACS never really a, achieved that. And maybe, you know, maybe under Feingold on some level, it, it, it will like that, that imprimatur will will mean something. But but let me when you talk about just and this may seem a little remedial, but when you talk about like sort of like outside pressure, like this stuff you, you, that you're talking about in terms of pressuring this stuff and groups aligning and whatnot. The general public's not really aware of it that much. I mean, I guess if they dig into like, I don't know, they they stumble on some deep axios or politico uh, thing or something. But but what does that actually mean? Like, how does that work? You've worked in all these different capacities. Like how did like why does that work or how does it? So um, one silver lining for people that get frustrated by you know, um, what can sometimes come off as the passive effort that are, is made by Democrats in all these fights is I, I sort of saw firsthand during my time in the Senate and believe this to be true now, um, uh, now that I'm running demand justice, Democrats are actually, Democrats more so than Republicans are actually quite sensitive to public pressure. Um, Republicans are often incorrigible and beyond shaming 
And you can have something like the blockade against Merrick Garland that consistently pours very, polls very poorly. And they will just sort of rally around the flag and they'll, you know, look at how unpopular it is to get rid of the ACA. And yet they're still conducting this litigation that is going to be argued before the Supreme Court right after the election. And so they keep their heads down and they sort of wall themselves up and become immune to public pressure. And they sort of they have a way of sort of making the politics come around to them because they're just so stubbornly plowing forward that it normalizes any position that they take because there's so much consistency in, across their party. Um, on our side, our folks tend to get spooked. Um, they get spooked by um, Republican colleagues thinking poorly of them, which contributes to this sort of passivity or you know desire to um, work across the aisle, even if it's uh, completely one-sided, the cooperation. Um, but they also are responsive to public pressure when it comes from a grassroots level. So calls in their offices, when I worked for Senator Schumer, um, this was one of the great insights of uh, Indivisible when it first got launched in 2017. It was the calls matter and show up at town halls and that matters. And they were absolutely right. When I worked for Schumer for six years, um, when he would return after floor votes back to his office, um, the first thing he wanted to see on his desk, you know, at usually the last vote, what is it, like 6 o'clock or 6.30. So he'd get back to his desk around 7 p.m. And before he would start some of his evening review of like white papers and memos that had been pre prepared from for the staff, the first thing he always wanted to have on his desk was a call sheet of the calls that had come in to all the field, all his um, in-state offices and the D.C. office. He wanted them, he wanted the bottom line figure of how many calls had come in. And then he wanted it broken out by issue. And that was something that then would be the basis of the first 10 or 15 minutes of conversation with the staff about why was, you know, all of a sudden calls are up on this issue. Maybe we should speak out on it. So they are wired to want to be responsive to public pressure um, and bad press. And so a lot of this stuff, you're right. Uh, it might be unseen by the general public because um, in the in the initial instance, it might just be a Politico story um, or it might just be a, a Washington Post blog item or it might just be an op-ed uh, that runs on the Data for Progress website that Sean McElwee runs. Um, but these things are seen by senators. And, um, and so, yes, it's earned media tactics. It is in some cases we do paid media uh, in Democratic home states about those senators. Like we've done digital ads in Delaware about Chris Coons when he was consistently voting for uh, Donald Trump's judicial appointees. And I think it, you know, Coons' posture towards Trump's judicial nominees has changed the last couple of years. Um, it is in state actions. Uh, so we have a lot of partner organizations that are on the ground that do sort of visits to senators' offices to drop off petitions, drop off letters, in some cases do sit-ins or demonstrations with signs outside the office. Um, we drive calls to offices. So we ask our members from time to time to do calls to action where we ask them to literally phone um, their offices and complain about you know a, an individual judicial nominee that a Democrat oughtn't be voting for, but is, um, just so that we can then get into that daily tally that the senators are reading at the end of the day. So they are responsive to grassroots tactics and and earned media tactics, paid media tactics, but it needs to be consistent. It needs to be, it needs to grow in size and scope over time. So it can't remain static. You need to show that something is catching on. So, um, but yes, in, in, you know, in general, I believe in that all that does work. Ryan Fallon, Executive Director of Demand Justice. Thanks so much for your time today. Really interesting stuff. And um, uh, I imagine we'll, we'll hear more and love to have you back soon. Yeah, and I want to say, th you know, when we did air that ad that you mentioned uh, on, the, on the podcast, uh, you said some very kind words about, the, about our organization in and around reading the ad script. So I, I did hear that and I appreciate it. Oh, all right. Well, all right. Thanks, uh, Brian Fallon. Um, all right, folks, we're going to take just a 15-second uh, break. We'll be back in just a moment. Uh, so, um, uh, Brian Fallon had mentioned this, uh, briefly, but, um, Amy Barrett, uh, Amy Coney Barrett's, um, support has gone up 
amongst Democrats and independents. It is actually at 51% of voters now back Barrett's confirmation, the most ever support, this is according to a morning consult uh, poll, for a Trump Supreme Court nominee. I don't know if there is a better measure for the failure of at least some of those Democrats on the um, uh, Judiciary Committee than that number right there. I mean, I, I just don't like what what else, what other evidence do you need that they're not doing it right? This is a um, a judge who is going to launch a frontal attack on a woman's sovereignty over her own body. This is a judge who sat on a as a trustee uh, for a school for, I think, three years, one that. um banned children who uh, whose parents were gay that basically um, discouraged at the very least uh, LGBTQ teachers and this is not this is not like 30 years ago this is this is from like 2015 to 2018 um, they 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 simply the strategy here was to just lay low not make any waves. Um, and it, um, it was a failed strategy by, by any measure. And it, even, even to the extent that um, they're looking just for the election, because, you know, to have a, a Supreme Court justice that's nominated that over 51% of the people think is okay, that reflects well on Donald Trump. And that's not what you would imagine a political party challenging the sitting president would want to do. But we will be talking more about this as the uh, week goes on. We are two weeks out from the election. We'll see you soon. All right, that is the um, that is the uh, end of our first hour. We are uh, going to move into our fun half of our program. Just a reminder: your support makes this show possible. Become a member. Join the Majority Report. Uh, join the Majority Report dot com. I just got a text that um, Sarah Silverman is telling stories again. Um, <laughs> well, we'll talk about that maybe in the fun half. Um, but uh, uh, join the majority report.com. And uh, also, uh, don't forget uh, the AM Quickie, seven minutes of headlines in your, uh, on your podcast, audio podcast machine, or you can watch it on YouTube at um, our uh, majority report audio youtube.com majority report audio or majority report live i think it is uh, majority report live i should probably get that down by now and also don't forget just coffee.coop fair trade coffee tea or chocolate use the coupon code majority get 10 percent off and check out uh nomi show at 3 p.m today youtube.com slash the nomi key show I'm getting that right. It's actually the G-N-O-M-E is really <laughs> so bad. I really think the employee thing was all, all it took. Employee, no me key. Oh, no, it was the no me. The G-N-O-M-E. <laughs> no me key. Okay. Uh, did it for me. I don't know why. I don't know why that did it. And, you know, oh, well, we won't even talk about that. But um, uh, so check that out today at 3 p.m., um, and uh, Jamie, what's happening on the Antifada? Hey, so this week on the Antifada, are my levels okay? I feel like I, I always get the levels wrong. Pretty good. You're I, good. Like a little, uh, I can't tell. If it's, I will be, I will, I will be. Go ahead. This, this week on the Antifada, I will be confused about the levels. No, um, we had back uh, our friend Pavlos Rufos, a very smart, very interesting uh, Greek communist friend of ours who's currently in Munich to talk about a little update on the situation in Greece. Um, the far right party, the Golden Dawn, uh, was just outlawed, uh, which was a major victory for anti-fascists everywhere. Um, we talk a little bit about uh, the relationship between the far right and the center right, um, where 
right-wing radicalization comes from and how people in Europe are viewing the U.S. Uh, in light of COVID. So check that out. That's up now. Patreon.com slash the Antifada. My guess is not well in terms of uh, the Europeans looking at, uh, at Americans at this point. Yeah, not so, not so good. I would imagine they're not terribly impressed. Um, Matt. Last night we had Joshua Khan wrestle on. We went deep into Bolivia in the, both the main show and the post game. Uh, we also talk about the Mi'kmaq versus commercial fishermen who the commercial fishermen, just to put a quantitative number towards like their way they're attacking these indigenous fishermen. They're upset that the indigenous people have set up 500 traps and the commercial industry there sets up 900,000. So uh, they decided to burn down uh, some lobster uh, <laughs> buildings because the indigenous people are setting 500 traps. What was that? Buildings? Yeah, they, they, lo- they burned down a building that was storing lobsters and poured like paint thinner into the lobster stuff. It's crazy. Uh, so we talked about that at patreon.com slash TMBS and the microbook show on YouTube. All right, folks. See you in the fun half. RM for it. All right, folks. 646-257-3920. See you in the fun half. Are you ready? <laughs> well, who sent us this? <laughs> <laughs> alpha males are back, 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 boy, back, and the alpha males are back, back, just as delicious as you can imagine. The alpha males are back, 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 boy, back, and the alpha males are back, 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 back. Just wanna degrade the white man. The alpha males are back, back. I take all of it to my throat. Alpha males are back. Almost says what? The alpha males are back, 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 back. You are a madman. And the alpha males are back, back, back. I, 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 I am a total cunt. Can we bring back DJ Danner song, please? Yeah, or a couple of them. Just put them in rotation. DJ Danner. Well, the problem with those is they're like 45 seconds long, so I don't know if they're enough of a break. That's fucking nonsense. Hey, folks. Fucking reminder. I do not have Parkinson's. And the alpha males are psych. Fuck them. Fuck them. Fuck them. Fuck them. Almost says what? 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 Have you tried doing an impression on a college campus? I, I think that there's no reason why reasonable people across the divide can't all agree with this. Psych. And the alpha males are back, 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 back. And the Africans are black, 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 black African. And the alpha males are back, 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 back. And the Africans are black, 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 black. There doesn't a little part of you think that America deserves to be taken over by jihadists. Keep it at 100. Can't knock the hustle. Come on! Fuck them! Fuck them! Fuck them! Fuck them! Fuck them! Things I do for the bigger game plan. By the way, it's my birthday! It's my birthday. birthday! Happy birthday to me, Jew boy! I have a thought experiment for you. And the alpha males are back, back. Africans are black, black. Alpha males are back, back. Africans are black. are back i'm gonna read a couple of ims and then go right to the phones uh the anti-pasta got a call from my father-in-law yesterday telling me that he won't be voting for trump this year he voted for him in 2016 and surprisingly he's not going to vote for lindsey graham despite being a personal friend of his for 30 plus years. 
father-in-law considers himself a staunch conservative but does not recognize Lindsay anymore and is not okay with Trump's coronavirus response or lack thereof. Father-in-law still holds the views I find reprehensible, but one less vote for Graham in South Carolina is a very good thing. I agree. Uh, Keith from Austin. Hey, Sam, I'm deep into graduate school at the moment. I haven't been able to listen as much, but I'm finally getting some time to catch up. Thanks for all the great work. Thank you. Uh, Roten the pig. Sam for Senate. David packed the courts. <laughs> Tim Pool tweeted, if Trump loses, he's incompetent. Is he smoothly distancing himself from Trump like smooth guy Shapiro? I, that's what it sounds like, right? Oh, it's a competence thing. Not that the American public rejects all of uh, what he stands for. Um, Sam, can you do a shout out for Stephen Robbins, a.k.a. Ronald Reagan show Redirect? Very good show with Matt Arkambault. Reagan does a terrible job promoting their show when he's on, and the name kind of sucks. But excellent show if you're interested in immigration law with some humor. That's right, folks. Redirect. Um, even though uh, I think uh, Ronald Reagan and I are having to, he's trying to get into a feud with me. That That's a way to raise his profile. I've seen people try that all the time. Rube Davin. Uh, oh, wait a second. Uh, uh, um, wait a second. Oh, okay. Uh, Hal Fat. I'm from um, Erie, Pennsylvania. Not so sure that Trump's little roast will do anything meaningful harm. We call it the mistake by the lake. Um, wow. Uh, Damien. That's a sick burn. Holy crap. Have you heard of this Giuliani scene in the new Borat film? I have not. Honest Abe. Hey, Sam. Lots of scare about the backdrops in your studio. I'd like to tap you into the broader cultural context. That sort of grittered colored field a design was pioneered by the artist Piet Mondrian. Uh, I'm sorry. Did you think I did not know about Mondrian? <laughs> Uh, so your backdrop is actually a part of a longer chain of appropriation. Regardless, Pacman is clearly copying you. Uh, Rube Davin, I know this will never happen, but can Pelosi call for impeachment hearings on Republican members of the Senate to delay confirmation? Well, you could do it for Bill Barr. Uh, you know, uh, Fallon mentioned that. Uh, analyst Stephen New Jersey, uh, the existence of those transitions to the fun half, a reminder how amazing the majority community is indeed. Uh, DMV Mike, can we get a La Poupée back in rotation? I like that song. Mm. Um, honest Abe, lots of talk about the backdrops. Oh, wait, you did that again. Uh, all right. Um, I think let's go to the phones. Calling from a 210 area code. Who is this? Uh, who is this and where are you calling from? Good afternoon, Sam. This is John from San Antonio. John, how are you? I had a feeling it might be you. Yeah, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. Yeah, I voted last Thursday, and I want to encourage everybody to vote. This election is expected to have the highest turnout percentage of eligible voters since 1908. So I'm, I encourage everybody to vote. That's huge, so, uh, right? I mean, but oh, uh, getting people texting me what the uh, what the the Borat thing uh, is with uh, Giuliani, but I'll talk about that in a moment. Sorry, I got distracted, John. We can't really know. I mean, it's look, it's a good sign, right? I mean, I would rather see those numbers than like, oh, there's only, you know, 0.01% of people have voted early. But we can't really know if those aren't cannibalizing, you know, votes on on, on uh, November 3rd or if they're indication of like a huge motivated turnout. Well, a lot of uh, poli-sci professors, you know, thought that this was going to happen. I mean, the, the guy I mentioned before, Michael McDonald, uh, who is now becoming extremely popular because, you know, he runs the election project and he's the one that's putting out the most current uh, numbers as far as voting uh, are concerned. I think right now there's over 40 million have already voted. So, I mean, we already had that, that uh you know, the 50% the that voted uh, as a percentage in 2018, you know, that was the highest since 1914. And so that's what a lot of poli-sci professors are basing that on. So, so that's we'll kind of where that, yeah, we'll see. But I, I feel really good about the turnout. And uh, I'm really happy for the American public that they are voting at, at the levels that they seem to be, you know, as far as their early voting, that they are as far as early voting. And I'm, re I'm so, reminded uh, that you knew about McDonald way before he blew up, right? Isn't that right? 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've been uh, been following this guy forever. I mean, you know, or not forever, but I mean, you know, it's just it's great to to get all the historical perspective of of elections and get the breakdown as in all the sociolo- sociological you know, demographics. So, uh, so Nate Silver has his uh, presidential, Senate, and House models up, and uh, while I think he's slightly overstating the percentage that Biden will win. Uh, will eventually prevail by he gives Biden an 88 percent chance of winning my guess is around 78 percent uh silver has vastly underestimated the chance of the democrats winning the senate he's moved past his original pick when he was at 67 percent uh nine points uh higher than uh than uh, his initial number of 58 percent silver's current number is at 75 percent while my number is at 83 so the the odds of the Democrats holding the House are are overwhelming. Uh, Silver has it at 95 percent. I have it at 99. The real differences are in the Democratic pickups right now. Uh, Silver has the Democrats only pick uh, only picking up six seats, while I have them picking up 16, which is much higher than most other forecasters. I also think the Democrats will win the generic ballot in the House by 8.5, which is only slightly lower than the, their 2018 uh, advantage of 8.6. Uh, Silver only thinks the Democrats will win the generic ballot by six points. The biggest surprise among forecasters, they see a very limited number of uh, House seats flipping. Silver only predicts seven seats flipping, and many other old-school forecasters see similar results. Now that we're less than two weeks away from Election Day, I've adjusted my calculations in the presidential race to include a two-week screen and a one-month screen in the most pivotal swing states. And here are some of those figures. In Pennsylvania, Biden is up by 3.9 in the two-week screen, 5.7 in the monthly screen. Okay, wait a in second. Florida- wait, 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 John. Just um, for those of us uh, who don't know what you mean by screen – which I would calculate is about, according to my percentage, about 100% of us. What do you, what, what does that mean? Two week screen, five week screen? Well, I mean, most forecasters, you know, pretty much throw out almost all results from anything before the last two weeks of the election because historically, those are the the two weeks that determine the results. Really, I mean, most of them just go by the last week. The 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 real problem with just going by the the ones that happened within the last week are that you know some of the top pollsters, uh, you know, will poll have their last poll before the last week, and so okay. you, you want to. So that's basically it. So. <clears throat> So, yeah, so in Florida, you know, Biden's up by 2.1 in the two-week screen, 3.4 in a monthly screen. Arizona, Biden's up by four points in a two-week screen, 3.4 in a monthly screen. North Carolina, Biden's up by three in a two-week screen and 3.2 in a monthly screen. Now, wait a second. Let me ask you this now, John, based upon those numbers. uh, am Am I reading it incorrectly when you tell me that the monthly screen has Biden up by a larger figure than the two-week screen, that the trend is not heading in the exact, uh, in the in the direction necessarily we'd want it to? Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. Uh, the, the, only, the only exception is Arizona. But, but the problem with, with doing a shorter screen, especially at this point of the, you know, with you know, thir- yeah. 13 days left, is that, you know, again, you, you don't have that many polls coming out. And so like, like, let's say in Texas, there's literally only one poll that was that started polling, uh, you know, within uh, two weeks uh, from today. So, I mean, so a, a larger screen gets a, a bigger advantage. And also a lot of the screens that came out right after the first debate where Trump was terrible, uh, I mean, those were the so-called high quality screens that didn't really perform that well in 2016. And so uh, they, you know, people like a Quinnipiac, a Monma, Siena, uh, you know, they're they're uh, mostly uh, phone polls, okay. and so those had huge leads for Biden on the state level after that. And so, yeah, I mean, so so yeah, slight is, I mean, Trump is so slightly edging closer to Biden in most swing states, and and so, you know. It, and so 2016, the same pollsters had a lot of bad results, uh, but they, they did bounce back in the 2018 House races and the Democratic primaries. I know a lot of people 
uh, felt let down by the polling in 2016. One of the problems with the media is that they did not adjust to the games that Trump was making in the last two weeks of the race. Uh, when you had Sam Wong on the day uh, before Election Day, uh, yet you know he had uh, Trump. I mean, Clinton with the 99 percent chance of winning, I called in and said that number was way too high, that, that Trump was gaining in the polls. And I still thought Clinton would win, but, but I gave the percentage at about 67 percent, which is better than any other data analyst. So uh, one of the, the best compliments I received on YouTube was when somebody you know, said you know, that Jink Ugar, when he said Trump was going to win, they didn't take it seriously. But when I said Trump could win, they started to get worried. So, uh, so generally, the odds of top forecasters uh, picking is extremely high. You know, Nate Silver picked every uh, state correctly in 2012 and only missed Obama winning in Indiana in, in 2008. 2004, Real Clerk Politics was essentially just an average of polls, also predicted every state correctly in 2000 and in 2004. In 2000, I couldn't find many forecasts, but I did find a 2000 paper by Columbia University's poli sci professors, Robert Erickson and Carl Sigmund. And they missed three races, Florida, which Bush officially won by 0.009%. And of course, uh, a lot of people say he didn't win it. So, uh, so Iowa, Iowa, which Gore won by 0.3%, and New Hampshire, which Bush won by one27 so before 2016, there was a 98% chance that top forecasters pick winners in these races in the 21st century. Uh, in 2016, most forecasters were wrong in five states, Florida, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin. The real clear politics did predict a Trump win in Florida. So right now, the, the, the chances of top four forecasters uh, predicting uh, states in the 21st century is down to 96%, which is slightly higher than the 94% of Senate races that were picked cor correctly in the, in the 21st century. Okay. I understand. So you're basically saying the polls were not that far off uh, in 2016 to the extent that they were. It was just the uh, people didn't update them two weeks, you know, in the, in the final two weeks when he closed largely because of the Comey letter. Right. Yeah, I think the Comey letter was was part of it. I think that there were uh, there were a lot of undecided voters. And that's that's one of the biggest issues uh, right now is that. You know, there there were I don't know between I mean it's hard to quantify exactly, but I mean I think the average is around twelve percent, which is extremely high. That was in twenty sixteen, but it's not. It doesn't. It feels like it's not nearly as high this time around. Right, right now it's about it's about six percent is what I'm seeing as an average, and that's uh that's about it's about average uh, for most elections, and so. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's. I, I think that that that's what that was one of the and that makes biggest a, issues. That makes a big deal when you see a poll uh, where Joe Biden is, you know, it's fifty to forty six is better than forty seven to forty two. Let's say, right? I mean, because you want if he's over fifty percent or at fifty percent. Uh, far less likely that he could lose because even if the undecided break towards Trump, they would all have to break towards Trump uh, for Biden to lose at that point. I mean, in general, is that right? Yeah, in general, it's right. But I mean, some people do change their minds also. I mean, I mean, so so even though they're at necessarily, you know, at a really high number, you know, something can can adjust those numbers also. Well, John, I mean, it doesn't happen that often, but I mean, John, know, it does happen. Let me say this. I am not changing my mind. You are the best out there. I don't care about the other uh, so-called old school pollsters uh, who are analyzing or data analysts. Um, you are still tops in, in my book, and we look forward to having uh, John on the program for our a, throughout our election day coverage. John, thanks so much for calling in. All right. Thank you, Sam. John from San Antonio, ladies and gentlemen. What a, you know, we talk about the, the things that make this pro program unique. Um, no one else has John from San Antonio. And believe me, that's it's one, of, one of the things that keeps me up at night. That, uh, Do you remember the one time he called into David Pakman? I, it's, that's the thing. That's the thing that uh, keeps me up at night. Uh, these uh, nightmares of um, 
uh, there where I, you know, somehow stumble onto David Pakman's show and uh, John from San Antonio is calling it. That would be, that would be disturbing. That would be disturbing. Heartbreaking, really. Heartbreaking. Heartbreaking. Um, oh, we do have that. Okay. Yeah. Let's, um, here is, um, this is awesome. Uh, and, and Mike from PA wanted me to get involved in this, but I, yeah, I'm, when I'm, when I've got the kids, I just don't have any time. I mentioned this yesterday, but if, if they do this again and I don't have the kids, I'm, I'm in, I don't even know what among us is. Uh, but AOC the other day says that, um, she wanted to get on Twitch, play among us, Matt, what is among us? I honestly don't know. It's like a party game. I think you have, I haven't played it. It's a bit too casual for me, to be honest, but uh, it's like a party game where you have to find an imposter. So, you know, it's oh, one for the normies. Like, first person. like mafia or something that like that. Like fun. Okay. Well, that's I play fun. that. No. Um, I, I thought it was a first person shooter, but I guess that doesn't make you, you wouldn't necessarily. No. Ilhan, Ilhan didn't join my uh, Titanfall 2 lobby. Unfortunately, I, I tried to tweet at her last night, but she was busy. All right, well, here yeah. is uh, AOC playing Among Us on Twitch and explaining to a British tw Twitch streamer, uh, HB Bomber Guy, or H Bomber Guy, about the U.S. healthcare system. She also, my understanding is, basically had like 400,000 people on there at one point, and uh, someone yeah, just... Uh, it was one of the biggest Twitch streams of all time. And and someone just, uh, uh, I am, said, um, you know, she got... Still to all 400,000 vote for Biden on the WFP um, uh, line uh, in Get New that York. clip too if we want. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's hear. I want to hear her explanation of our health care system. So you go to the doctor and then mm -hmm. what, what happens? Do you just walk up and you say, I need help? And then they say, you know, how, how does that work? Yeah, like, I can't even imagine that interaction without a credit card or some sort of cash payment. I'm the other way you, around. You, you go, you just, you know, you, you, you go to the doctor and you say, I have this problem. And then they prescribe you the medicine and then you just go pick it up and that's it. And then you go home and you Google how much it would have cost in America. Oh, right? my gosh. Uh, yeah, for me too. And that's how you get radicalized. No, no. No, no, I, I'm just fascinated. So, like, she's just sitting in that room and doesn't have to play at that point. There's no immediacy. Like, you're not going to get shot by anybody. It's just like, and then you guys go like, okay, well, thanks for explaining like uh, healthcare, and then and then <laughs> now do we go find the the thing on the thing? Yeah, I think you like usually you have to find the imposter among us, and there's a different. Uh, a way to do that and i don't think typically one of the ways is to have them explain healthcare uh, in different countries but maybe it would help i don't know now does that talk is that, is that talking part of the uh i mean generally in like figuring out who the imposter is but i don't know i'm gonna feel like what, what a grandpa but that kid that's <laughs> you'd be very good at that game, it seems so. like that game seems a little bit a little bit slow for me i like one that's where there's a little bit more uh adrenaline rush but let's hear uh i was uh, hoping to watch aoc and ilhan omar like kill some nazis or something that's what i thought was gonna go on too but um let's 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 hear um um uh, a little bit more from uh, aoc um on that uh, twitch stream and we're super excited here. If you happen to live in the state of New York, we have this really exciting opportunity, um, which is we have the ability to, yes, vote Trump out of office. Yes, vote for a Biden Kamala ticket. But in New York, we actually have a way to also do both of those things and still tell the Democratic Party, listen, you got to do better. And um, and we can do so much more and we can be so much more ambitious. And the way that you do that is by voting for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris on the Working Families Party line. Again, that's uh, just in New York. And if you when you vote for them on the WFP line, the Working Families Party line, you help support uh, infrastructure that helps support other progressive candidates all the way up and down the ballot and uh, and progressive causes as well. So if you're in New York, uh, vote for the Biden-Harris ticket on the WFP line. Everyone else, 
let's vote blue, let's get out the vote, let's make sure we change this country. Uh, and I'm really, really excited. I, mean, I just, you know, it was interesting what Fallon was saying that, uh, that he really thinks a lot of this is generation. Well, the two things. One is the WFP was part of that, uh, those coalition that was like pushing Chuck Schumer a little bit. Um, uh, the other is that, um, the, that Fallon sees this as a, a generational thing is interesting to me. Um, and I think there's, I think that's, I think there's some of that is there. I think also some of it is, you know, um, uh, somewhat ideological, but I also think that my sense is that, you know, people can be ideologically squishy in, in, in one direction or another. And to the extent that these guys are ideological, I think they're also a little squishy. And I think they just, uh, there's a misunderstanding of where the, where the pushes are coming from. And I, I don't know, some of it is generational. AOC gets in there and, and she is, if, even if you put aside the ideology from a partisan standpoint, and she doesn't care, she doesn't care what the Republicans think of her. And um, that is, you know, I, I, I imagine part of that is, um, you know, a function of her ideology, but I also think that it is a distinct um, trait. I mean, I think it's a, a dis there is a, there is a greater, um, there is a less of a willingness by younger politicians to defer to institutions that have failed in, in providing what they're supposed to provide, I think. Well, I would say she also, more importantly, has an independent and at least semi-independent power base in the form of uh, Justice Democrats, the organization that really pushed her, and DSA to some degree, which played a role as well in terms of um, donating money, but also labor time to help her get elected. Yeah, I mean, I think a big thing is that the, the, the advent of, of fundraising, essentially, that is outside of um, the, the, the channels that have been available to Democrats for an extended period of time. I mean, she's the number three fundraiser in the I think in the the Democratic caucus, at least in the House, um, but you see this from others too, right? And 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 certainly, you know, having support from DSA, just De uh, Justice Democrats, you know, WFP. I mean, these outside organizations are getting uh, are getting stronger, no doubt. Uh, having you know resources outside of the the party structure is um, is also key to that. But I think just dispositionally, you know, I mean, I think that. What you're talking about, Jamie, is like why she has been successful. But the disposition, I think, precedes uh, that, that, that support. In fact, probably drew, you know, drew that support. But dispositionally, we're seeing this more. And I feel like it's a, it is, it is a, genera a, a, a generational thing, largely, obviously not exclusively. But, uh, well, without that power base, she would either uh, lose know, or she would change her disposition. That's right. We wouldn't know who she was. Um, uh, let's do. Um, let's do. Uh, let's do the Dave Rubin stuff. Should we do? It? I know it's a little bit early to do it, but let's do it because it's just too fun. Um, Jamie. What does the word gaslight mean? I don't mean to put you on the spot if you don't feel comfortable answering the question, uh, but I know you're on the internet a lot, so maybe you'd know. Oh my God. I feel like it's actually pretty misused, but it's basically when you tell somebody that their own perceptions are tricking them, right? Like uh, people use it in reference to abusers a lot. Like, right. oh, that didn't happen, honey. You're just confused. Right. Where you're trying to basically convince somebody that they're they're a little bit crazy for believing something, um, you must be on the internet all the time because my understanding is that's an internet term, yeah. according to Dave Rubin. Well, oh, and we should just say this is uh, who did this uh, clip. This is um, this is from clips oh Dave, Dave on Twitter. Uh, yeah, Dave Rubin's clips on uh, clips Dave on Twitter. It is uh, a juxtaposition between. Dave Rubin um, making a mistake and correcting himself. 
the, the whole thing is just sort of bizarre to me, but go ahead. I actually made a factual error last week. You're not going to believe it. I am not the perfect human being. I was talking about gaslighting last week, which is Pause an internet one. tactic. You know, this is and a basic- little peeve of mine. This whole thing, and uh, I've encountered this in, uh, in, in many different uh, areas of my life. When, they, when someone makes a mistake and says, I'm not a perfect human being. You know, I'm not a perfect person. And, you know, um, I don't think you, there's necessarily expectations that you're a perfect person. I, I've always found that when someone responds to, to something like that, I've always found that to be uh, indicative of maybe a little narcissism or something like that, like where it's where, oh, I have to respond to this critique, perfectly legitimate critique, by saying that you're expecting me to be perfect and without flaw. No, it's just somebody's pointing out a flaw. That's all right. People are flawed. Everybody knows that. But go ahead. That's just my own personal little gaslighting last week, which is an oh, go, internet go, tactic. Go back, go basically, back. what I'm about gas- I actually made a factual error last week. You're not going to believe it. I am not the perfect human being. I was talking about gaslighting last week, which is an internet tactic. And yeah. basically, what I said was something to the effect of that gaslighting is when you attack people online so over the top they don't even really know how to respond. That's actually not quite right. Gaslighting. Gaslighting is when, in effect, it's a, it's a phrase that sort of was born online because it's the idea that you go sort of so over the top with your response to somebody that it sort of it burns down the whole house. So instead of making like a cogent point, if somebody if you're arguing with somebody, instead of making like just a sensible point, you gaslight them, meaning you just say something so crazy or so over the top that you've just destroyed the whole thing. Now, a few people did attack me. Oh, Ruben doesn't know what he's talking about. He got the definition of gaslighting wrong. Okay. Uh, but, but actually, most people said, you know, we like you, Dave. You, you dropped the ball on this one. A lot of people sent me links and the rest of it. So I do want to correct. We like it. Like, like, what? Wait, so... Yeah, I now I, I now I made a mistake the other day. Uh, I somehow got was under the impression that Glenn Greenwald was uh, went on the Hannity program, and he did not go on the Hannity program. He had gone on the Tucker Carlson program, which we had known for a long time. I I, I brought it up because I assumed I had seen this, and somebody was defending him from going on Hannity. And um, and I want to say uh, a couple of people said to me that I was wrong, but other people said I'm a good guy. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, I'll stick with the, you're a good guy and uh, you're a good dad. So, but anyways, let's go back to Dave Rubin. <laughs> and the rest of it. So I do want to correct what the definition of gaslighting is. So the actual definition of gaslight is in reference to the 1944 movie aptly titled Gaslight, which is to manipulate uh-huh. someone by psychological means into questioning their own sanity. That is actually the sort of internet 2020 definition what? of uh, of gaslight. When I was saying, oh, you just keep saying things that are so over the top, it's like people don't know how to respond. That seems like an offshoot. I would say that's an offshoot of gaslighting, but hey, I'm not the perfect human pause being, it, pause guys. It, pause it. Uh, is the non-perfect human being going to have to issue a correction on his saying that's an offshoot of what he was saying? <laughs> Yeah, I'm actually impressed that he got it this wrong because a lot of people use it incorrectly uh, to just mean lying. But this feels like a few steps further down the road of wrongness. No, it's when you say something so much that you burn the house down because you <laughs> let the gas light. <laughs> I guess. Yeah, I, I'm trying to figure out how he made that error. And it's so, the sort of thing where it's like if you say something like, Oh, Dave, that guest of yours has previously like denied the Holocaust happened. Uh, does that him? Oh, well, that's so crazy. I guess everything's burned down now. He can't actually like go back yeah. and look at actually my guest did do that. He used another one of Dave Rubin's favorite, uh, you know, illusions. This is kind of like 1984 all over again. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it, it, it's amazing. Uh, do, is there any more uh, for? That's it. That's well, it. remember the remember when he t- misused circling the wagons? Oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> to mean the exact we need well. like a glossary of Rubenisms. He I, he meant to be like the sharks are circling, but <laughs> circling the wagons. I feel like that's indicative of, of Dave not reading very much. I mean, it's like when you get like, like when you like you know, it's one thing to sort of like uh mispronounce 
you know, uh, words that you've only read. Like that's like that's a sign like where you know, you know, you get a sense of someone's like what they know is from what they've read. But when you don't know things like circling the wagons or gaslighting, it it suggests to me that he's really incurious. But I think that we already sort of knew that about. Yeah. <laughs> I love his commitment to it being an internet thing as well and not this, you know, uh, principle that's been around since a play from the 1930s. Yeah. I mean, there was, I remember learning about what gaslight meant because of the Jamie probably like, there's a band called the gaslight anthem. Right. Mm -hmm. And so like, that's where I learned about that. So this is not just a new internet 2020 thing. As Ironically, no uh, about it. It, it has gotten much more, um, it has gotten much more popular, uh, much more popularly used, I think, um, you know, particularly because of the idea of fake news and the idea of, of basically a president getting up there and saying, you know, up is down and down is up, that type of thing. But um, the, the it just strikes me as sort of uh i don't know for a guy who who says like twitter's not real life and get off <laughs> that he's like i don't know he perceives that word as is the internet 2020 it's just a communication and you just didn't understand what people have been talking about all this time that's all wow. it's a means of communication and you just didn't understand what everybody was saying yeah, it's actually interesting how uh, stable that definition has been, despite how popularly it's being used. Mm -hmm. Well, the important thing to remember is Dave Rubin is extremely not mad, and he extremely has a life outside of online. So all you haters can go, uh, go, go leave the gaslight on at your own house and torch yourself, because that's what you're doing when you criticize Dave Rubin. How's this for, um, for a button? It turns out that the Gaslight Anthem Band is fronted by a man named Brian Fallon. Crazy. <laughs> named a guest today. Um, it all comes full circle. Full circle. Uh, Ruben, yeah, Ruben's ability to not know what's happening is, uh, is pretty impressive. I mean, I got to say. You know, and, it, and, and that point about the stability of it, do you know that, uh, that saying, um, uh, Rolling Stone gathers no moss? Are you guys familiar with that? Of course. I always assumed growing up that it was a um, that it was a a positive attribute to not grow gather moss, right? Like that that saying was like you know you want to keep. I always interpreted that saying as meaning you want to keep moving, right? You don't want to um, you don't want to uh, to like atrophy on some level. Is that how you guys understand is, that? Is that what yeah. you told your girlfriends when you uh, had to keep it moving? <laughs> no, but did, did you guys not, do you guys? Yeah, no, I understood it as, yeah, you don't want that moss on you, so keep it rolling. Yeah. Oh, well, you guys, I feel like this is very gendered because it implied something quite different to me. What did it imply to you? I mean, I guess I hadn't thought about it that deeply until just now when you brought it up, but like... I don't know. I thought of moss as like a good thing, like baggage, like human relationships. Roots are like, good. Well, you're 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 right. You, the way that I mean, it, the, the it, I was reading, you know, that I had presumed that it meant you don't want to gather moss, and I read of human bondage. I don't know. This is probably been 25 years ago or something. I just remember this distinctly. And I had read it and simultaneously my uh, step-grandfather at the same time had said the same thing to me. And it was a, like, um, like almost like a cautionary um, phrase. Like, you, you know, you keep moving around, you're not going to grow any roots type of thing. Yeah. And yeah, moss is good. Uh, it turns out moss is good, but I don't know how it's interpreted today. I still am unclear because, um, you know, maybe it was because like, I don't know, Bob Dylan made it romantic, like, uh, you know, like a Rolling Stone type of thing. I don't know. Uh, the song that launched a million fuck boys. There you go. <laughs> um, say yas to the moss. That's what I say. Um, I mean, I, I, yeah, I'm still, 
I, I just thought that was, I found it interesting that I was under the perception anyways, that the, the meaning had changed over the course of uh, whatever it was, the 70, 80 years that um, I had been, uh, that, you know, it, at least it had been in usage as far as I could date it back to uh, Somerset Mom, because I think he wrote that in like the, the maybe, I don't know, first decade or two of. Uh, yeah, yeah, 1918 or something like that, I think. Um, uh, here is uh, Dave Rubin. One more time, we might as well uh, get where uh, Dave Rubin, when he's not getting confused about what um, uh, phrases that people utter are uh, on uh, the internet, he's getting confused about how science works and what is real life and what is actually uh, just the movies. Well, if we're going to say trust the scientists, which is a silly notion, right? You know, there's a lot of evil scientists out there. There's a lot of bad guy scientists out there. Have you ever seen a science fiction movie? I mean, not every scientist is right about everything. And by the way, you know what happens in science? You're not going to believe this guy. Pause it for one second. Jeez. This guy, it's unbelievable. Honestly, he's an adult. First of all, incidentally, science fiction movies are not about scientists necessarily. They're, they're, fiction that involved maybe futuristic uh, science and technology that will develop and uh and then well we'll i love there's a lot of evil scientists out there like i mean okay maybe the ones that work for like exxon and dupont like right but honestly it's like evil scientists is just sort of i i I mean you know i don't know like there's a lot of evil lawyers out there i mean and trust i mean the the idea is when they say trust the scientists they're they're talking about the preponderance of science the nature of science as a discipline is that it is reliable because it is subject to constant questioning and challenging that is the that is the discipline known as science where People have theories and they constantly test it and that everyone within the discipline tests it and you assess what is the best science by what the results of those tests are and how many tests have been made on it and what the preponderance of the results of those tests are. He doesn't seem to understand any of those concepts or he's just lying. But go back to the beginning, watch it again so we can do it un- uninterrupted. Well, if we're going to say trust the scientists, which is a silly notion, right? You know, there's a lot of evil scientists out there. There's a lot of bad guy scientists out there. Have you ever seen a science fiction movie? I mean, not every scientist is right about everything. And by the way, you know what happens in science? You're not going to believe this, guys. There are often discoveries that then get debunked by things after that as we get finer instruments and more information and the rest of it. Science is often in the business of debunking science. That's the beautiful thing, you know? Um, So- That's the beautiful thing about science. That's why it's actually reliable in that it's constantly being tested and updated. Yeah, even ICP kind of walked back their stance on scientists. (laughs) (laughs) Who's ICP? The insane oh. clown posse. Oh. Yeah, like they had that line in the song Miracles. I don't want to talk to a scientist. Y'all MFers lying and getting me pissed. They yeah. clarified that it was, you know, it was hyperbole because they are just so enamored with the magic of nature, you know, whereas for Dave, it's more like uh, he doesn't want people to be wearing masks. Exactly. Like, you know, and and this is who should we be trusting in the realm of science as opposed to the scientists? Fashionistas? Yeah, that's like an old, like, intelligent design argument that, like, science has been wrong before. It's like, yeah, the people who proved that the previous science was wrong was the newer scientists with a better idea. (laughs) She's just unbelievable. It is funny to think about uh, Dave Rubin battling evil scientists in his mind, though. There could be evil scientists. Yeah, climate scientists is what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. Um, I was going to go see my doctor, but then I realized there could be evil doctors. So I wasn't sure if I should go. Mm -hmm. He He could be prescribing me something that's evil. (laughs) (laughs) Just... 
Oh my God. Colin from an eight, what? 818 area code. Who's this? Hey, Sam. Long time no see. Dave from Jamaica. Dave Hi, from crew. Jamaica. How are you, Dave? Um, Not bad. I was about to say, um, I'll, I'll make this one a little bit funner. I think, Sam, yeah. just saying for the numbers, you should do an Among Us stream amongst you, your comrades. It's a lot more fun than you guys give it credit for. All right. And, and and Matt and Matt knows I'm no ca- filthy casual, so <laughs> <laughs> you guys should try it. Yeah. But other than that, I think what they did with that stream was pretty effective. I mean, like just looking at the numbers of people, and I think people seeing how AOC is like a normal person, and while working in the political message at the same time, but in non in a non forced way, it's pretty. It's, I think might be pretty effective. I, I what you what I I mean I think mm-hmm. honestly like I look at stuff like that and it's just it seems mm-hmm. to me like I don't know if I you know I actually think that the the value of stuff like that is um there there may be some sort of short term value to it but long term mm-hmm. right you have 400,000 people I don't know how many hundred thousands of people in 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 this you know in this country but you have hundreds of thousands of young people who are fundamentally altering the way they perceive a politician. And it is, you know, it, it, it gives them the sense that they have access to these people. It gives them the sense that they're act that, that, that these politicians are people. And, you know, how much more engagement are you going to get from that many more people just based upon that? You know, I mean, this is, you know, young people in particular, mm-hmm. like, you know, just from my own experience as, as, as a parent, I mean, you know, my kids, like there are, and, and people probably, you know, recall this, you know, like moments like that, where you're like, oh my God, I got access to a politician, even if it's, you know, it's on the platform that they under, you know, understand that they, they were many people, uh, you know, uh, during coronavirus is the way they were relating to their friends anyways. But for a lot of kids that age, that's basically how they, they do it. And that that's going to have there are going to be people who you know five ten years from now who are activists or involved as as just better citizens in some way and they're gonna like point to like that was a moment where i was like yeah this is actually something i could engage in and i think that's incredibly healthy for uh our democracy and uh incredibly healthy for you know um a, a, a progressive movement. I, I don't want to overstate the thing, but I just think it's indicative of her approach. Um, the emotional and, connection is important. It's definitely it because you can't just rationalize it all, right? <laughs> yeah, no. I mean, I think it's really. I think it's. I, I think it's. It's great. And um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I think it's great. I mean, look. You know, it's not something so different from what politicians have done for ages, right? They go to the county fair, they go and eat a corn dog or whatever it is. It's just that um, she is adept enough to realize like, or maybe doesn't even, maybe it's, maybe it's not even something that's like even has to be that calculated. It's like, she's just doing what politicians have done for a long time. It's just, she's just aware that like, She's just not ossified like a lot of our politicians. And, um, and so I don't know. I think it's great. I, 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 you know, I think it's great. Anything that brings uh, good politics to the, uh, the barbaric zoomers of the internet is uh, good in my book. <laughs> well, I, uh, the other part is I, I do want to see like Sam marinate somebody for the long game and then snap their neck end game. So that there's that, so I can mm. look forward to. All right, well, I, I'll, <laughs> I'm not exactly sure I know what that means, but I appreciate the call, Dave. Um, Colin from an eight four seven area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hey, it's Josh from Chicago. Josh from Chicago. How are you, Josh? Getting all the great hits today. Yeah. Oh, thank thank you for thinking of me like that. I appreciate it. Well, I mean, it's, yeah, uh, it's something you say. Um, no, I'm, I'm doing good. Um, 
I just have some, uh, I want to talk about Bolivia, but I also just have some advice for you the next time you debate Tim Pool. Uh, I don't know if there, there will be a next time. He seems to have been mad at me for, um, for um, expressing, I, I don't know. I guess what he, I, I'm not even clear what he's mad at me for. I, 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 I can't help but think it's a little bit manufactured and I'm not quite clear why. But um, yeah, you, you know. won't go to his studio and sit you down across from him and people I, who may or may not have he COVID. He wasn't mad at me when we DM'd about it. He wasn't mad at me for not going to the studio. He would seem to be mad because after the fact, I mean, after I explained to him, like, I can't travel there. And I expressed, I didn't say it explicitly, but I was like, and what are you doing about COVID? You just <laughs> rolling the dice and, you know, hope it doesn't land on seven, I think is something that I said. And he said, you know, Rogan didn't have people, you know, had people in this is, you know, didn't worry about it. And I was like, well, neither did Trump. Um, <laughs> and, but, uh, and then he, he tweeted out something that made it, that implied that like, just all these leftists were being chicken in private about going to see him. And so I tweeted out, like, I'm one of those people. I, you know, the idea of flying or, you know, and driving and flying uh, to get to a studio that would have taken, I don't know, five or six hours, probably round trip. I mean, no, each way. And then, um, and then going into a studio with him and uh, at least two other people, as far as I can tell, who like, you know, I mean, maybe, uh, maybe they're not going out and doing stuff, but it's like, I'm not sending my kids to school because, you know, I'm concerned about COVID. Uh, there's nobody in my studio right now because I'm concerned about COVID. Um, you know, the, like, I'm not going into a place where, you know, just for, 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 to be on Tim's show, um, you know, and didn't, didn't expose myself to all of that. It's not, you know, I, it's just, not, yeah, but the calculation doesn't make sense. Value. Um, I will say <laughs> if you drive to DC and get in the studio with Tim yeah. pool before you get in the studio with us, uh, but it's to own Tim pool. I will not be offended. Oh, I know it's not a question of f offense at all. And, and, and believe me, believe me. I have seriously considered it. And and I said to him, if I maybe if I get a day off, and I do mean that, if there's a way that I could actually um if I could actually like make it there uh without, you know, because I, I could leave here at I guess 3 p.m., 3 30, get there in time for 8 p.m. and then somehow like do the show for a couple hours and then drive back at 10 p.m. <laughs> and come back at four in the morning. If I don't have my kids that day. I could probably make it work. And maybe, you know, we get into like December. Uh, maybe that's something I would do. I'm not going to do it in the next two weeks because we're going to do a 12 hour show and, you know, we've got to do the debate and that type of thing. But all right. But Josh, that's not why you called. That has yes, nothing to Bolivia. do with uh, Bolivia. No. Yes. Um, um, so, I mean, obviously it's a great victory. I think what happened uh, in the elections were uh, this weekend, but um, uh, Luis Arce winning. Um, and winning by like 20 points is a huge victory. But like the thing that I thought of, um, especially when the Morales, the coup against Morales happened, um, the thing that struck me and the thing that I've been thinking of is just how similar these right wing parties, the right wing in Bolivia acted in, the, I think, a very similar way that the right wing here has been acting. Um, obviously, I mean, we, we haven't seen a, a necessarily a coup, but, um, you know, I, I kept, um, you know, obviously the reason they thought that there was fraud, right? The reason that they, their contention for there being fraud was that the, the rural votes came in later uh, from, from the, the votes from rural parts of Bolivia came in later. Uh, coincidentally, those people happen to be indigenous uh, more often than not having to be indigenous. But, um, you know, I, I immediately thought of Paul Ryan talking about ballot harvesting. Yep. Um, and I and I think um, really, uh, to me, I just I, I think the um, and unfortunately, our liberal Democrats prop up these right wing fascists, a lot of them. But I do think the parallels between that and the way the Republican Party has been acting and has been acting really for decades because like voter suppression didn't start with Trump, like voter intimidation didn't start with Trump. 
to me, it, it's very frightening and scary. And I think a lot of people, like just even like, not even just leftists, but people on the center left really need to be paying attention to uh, uh, what happened in Bolivia, because um, I don't want to be the alarmist to say it could happen here, but the tactics that they're using are, are very similar in the way that they will call something fraudulent. Mm -hmm. um, and even like just, um, again, the fact that a lot of these people who supported Morales, supported uh, the party that Morales belonged to, happened to be indigenous. And right. um, the way they're sort of calling those votes fraudulent, and uh, right, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think, think there's, I think there's, yeah. I think that's true in terms of tactics. I mean, I think for for uh, you know the the missing ingredient there is uh, you know an imperial power that is influencing a regional uh, organization that ostensibly is providing like a fig leaf for a military coup. Absolutely. With that, with that said, you know, uh, Trump does control that uh, apparatus of that country, right? So, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in that country being the United States. So, yeah, I mean, people should be concerned, of course. Um, yeah, I will say uh, it's not exactly analogous because uh, it's not one to one the yeah. the relationship of the. Uh, the movement on the ground to Moss is not the same as the organized left's relationship with the Democratic Party here. If we're talking about, you know, the general election, oh, um, I, I would say that, you know, Morales is more comparable to Bernie Sanders in that he's sort of a, a social Democrat with a developmentalist project, uh, a, a, so, sort of a left populist nationalist. But um, I will say the left can learn a lot from the way people organized in Bolivia, right? Because it's not just that enough people voted for Moss for Moss to win. Right? This was voted. the culmination of a massive social movement on the part of the working class of Bolivia, which is heavily indigenous, that organized strikes and blockades and massive demonstrations for a year leading up to this thing, because without that, they would have stolen the election, right? A hundred percent. 100%. So, so the, I feel like that's the missing link. Like when people compare uh, Morales to Bernie, um, there, there are, you know, there are certainly right. some parallels, but the movement uh, is something that we really lack in the U.S. and something that it's not really possible to just reverse engineer from an electoral campaign with a populist platform. And they did so much with so little, right? The indigenous working class of Bolivia is much poorer than the working class of the U.S. on the whole. And I really, I, I'm so inspired by what they managed to do there. I mean, and I should say, Moss was not the be all and end all of their project, right? There are leftist groups there who have a stance of critical support for Moss, much like, you know, uh, folks like me had critical support for Bernie, but it, it's part of a larger socialist project that I think is really inspiring. Yeah, I just think the way the right operates, though, in a lot of these I think there's there are parallels to the way the, the right, the right yeah. is how they over they're overthrowing, and I just think one of the re one of the reasons they weren't able to pull this in the the election again was because that uh, you know Moss won by 20 points, and there was just it would have exposed them completely had they tried to pull sort of the, like oh this is a fraudulent election, and so um, you know. But you want yeah, to win elections, and you want to make sure that there's no room for um, uh, for the obvious like plans that the right have in this country, anyways, um, to uh, mess with the outcome. You got to run up the vote, is what you're saying. Yeah, that yeah. is the final piece of the puzzle, for sure. For sure, no, it's part part of it, but I also just think again the parallels with the way the right acted right. in both situations. Mm -hmm. They're they're striking and. We, yeah, I mean, the, I, I agree. We had Joshua Khan and Russell on. I mean, the right steals elections. They did it in 2000. And it didn't take like a Bernie Sanders or Evo Morales. Al Gore wasn't that. But they still steal elections. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's I think that that end of the le side of the ledger is definitely. I also think from just a, a perspective in terms of like um, what it does for future endeavors, you know, in imperialist endeavors, if you will. Um, you know, there's already an increasing 
and I think um, broader understanding and skepticism of the American government in situations like this, right? I mean, there, you know, even when you have both parties um, feeding Juan Guaido at a um, State of the Union address, and both parties did, uh, as if he was the <laughs> as if he was the president. And he was just basically at that point, uh, you know, um, a uh, uh, senator, I guess, or um, the skepticism that we're seeing amongst the American public, I think now, and, you know, on some, to some extent, to some extent, the media, I think it's incredibly healthy. And this um, lends a lot of support to that skepticism. It makes it, it just makes it harder for uh, the US government and other governments <clears throat> to, I'm not saying it forecloses it, but it makes it harder uh, to get away with these type of coups. Um, and I think that's, um, you know, that's not, I mean, I guess it, that's helpful to Bolivia in this case as well. But I mean, that's that's something that I think is just helpful more broadly speaking in terms of the way that this country particularly relates to um, to other countries in this hemisphere. You know, aside from Canada, we don't seem to do that with Canada for some reason. I'm not quite sure why. Uh, although we did import Fox. Um, the Guardian uh, paper is reporting that um, the new Borat film, this is uh, Sasha Baron Cohen's uh, film, and uh, which is released, was released on this Friday, on this Friday coming or the one, the, the past coming, one? Coming Friday. Uh, the former New York mayor, this is Rudy Giuliani, and current personal attorney of Donald Trump is seen reaching into his trousers and apparently touching his genitals while reclining on a bed in the presence of the actor playing Borat's daughter, who is posing as a TV journalist. Oh, my God. What? Oh, my God. Oh How my is God. this a story in 2020? I remember oh seeing God. the Borat movie, like, in college and thinking it was really funny because I was high. Oh, it was funny. He, he's a genius. He, I mean, this... You should go into exactly the setup of this joke here. I mean, it's a spoiler alert. And it's funny because The Guardian, this is a major news story. It's kind of, it seems like. And The Guardian has a spoiler alert at the top of it for the new Sasha Baron Cohen movie. But basically, it looks like they lured Rudy uh, into like a hotel room or something for like some after interview drinks. And then Rudy starts getting a bit, you know, comfortable, reaching his hands on his pants. And then Sasha Baron Cohen, I think, comes in and says, wait, wait, she's only 15. She's too old for you. Is that what happens? Yes. What? Oh, my God. <laughs> God. Uh, I'm going to have to watch that oh all the way through. God. Oh, my God. That's so fantastic. <laughs> I'm a big fan of some of his work. It's really, I think, was really impressive. The I Showtime show is he's great. still tricking people. It, that's he's so good. Thing about it. Yeah, it's he the had, producers and him and their ways of like tricking people that is like the the real thing that they're doing there. It's quite amazing because I, I worked on, you know, a similar project uh, that came out as a show a year ago on True TV. And it's I had to do some of that booking and like the degrees to which you'll go to to tell people things is just it's, it's a lot. <laughs> Same with Nathan for you, for that matter. Uh I think the last uh, WTF pod I listened to was him uh, talking to Mark Maron about the clown, like the deep history of clown philosophy and how he uses that in his work. And, yeah, really amazing stuff. Yeah, I mean, the, the, British, the, the, the British approach this stuff in a very different way than Americans, I think. And part of it, I think, is that like, our, our comedy culture for many years is dominated by stand-ups. It, it is, it has changed a little bit. There's like more people coming out of improv and like, frankly, like UCB, which was all sort of emanated out of like Glenn Close and Glenn Close, I think his name was, uh, out of Chicago. And there was this sort of like whole, uh, almost academic, um, tradition in the context of, of improv which is the closest that we've gotten to in American comedy. But, but the British, they take this stuff, they're, they're much more academically inclined 
for all this stuff, I think. Maybe maybe Europeans are. Um, I like a good Britcom. Uh, my favorite thing that um, Benjamin, well, I, it was it was my mother's boyfriend at the time uh, showed me and it became like in, in cross comedy, we all watched it like a million times. Um, Benjamin and I would watch it constantly and we gave it to David Cross and he just watched it. I mean, it was all on VHS and it was a Harry Enfield special called Sir Norbert Smith. And it was interesting because like I would, I, I knew some, some Brits or had, uh, later met some Brits and, and none of them were terribly blown away by it because I think for the British, it was more of like a parody. It was the, the, the life, it was sort of like a documentary looking back on the, the, the life of a, a, an actor, a British actor who had been knighted, I guess. And um, it, it was specific parodies of these different movies, I guess, throughout his life. But for, for an American, it doesn't read as a parody. It reads as a satire more. Like, you know, like sort of more uh, about a genre and about sort of, um, you know, fame than it does like specific actors. We had, you know, we don't have that tradition here so much. You know, maybe like the, the closest thing was like, you know, that um, the actor's studio type of thing where we would take that stuff seriously. But, but you know, in Britain, it was it was different. So it, it came off as a, as a satire more than a parody. And that was, I, I mean, honestly, that was that was just unbelievable stuff. Very funny. Speaking of British satires, um, people exactly my age will really appreciate uh, the show Nathan Barley, which is actually the same guy as... Um, Black Mirror. He's become like a cranky old Gen Xer who thinks that phones are bad. But um, in the early 2000s, he made a really, really good parody show about the London hipster scene that will uh, definitely tickle the funny bone of anyone my age who was ever around that culture, even tangentially. Hmm. Come from a 541 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hi, Sam. This is Art in San Diego. Art in San Diego. It was Dell Clothes. Art, just in case you were wondering, is Dell Clothes. Yes, and he was the father of the Harold. That's right. Okay, I remember, which is the long-form improv. Go ahead, uh, Art. Yes, I had a comment on the framing of Supreme Court expansion. Um, the issue is not, as a caller last week suggested, one of balance, which would ultimately work in the conservatives' favor. Instead, the, the relentless focus should be on the intertwined issues of the consent of the governed and the fundamental unacceptability of minoritarian rule. Because so, as everyone knows, oh, go ahead. No, you go ahead. So presidential elections are the way citizens have the most direct impact on the Supreme Court. And in six of the last seven presidential elections, the less conservative candidate got the most votes. And yet here we are facing a 6-3 conservative Federalist Society packed Supreme Court. And just so everyone knows, the Federalist Society's project, which we're now staring down the barrel of the gun at, is minoritarian rule by concentrated wealth with white supremacy and uh, theocratic cultural authoritarianism thrown in. So I, I would just encourage people. I think that's to, I think that's well put. Um and I also I like the idea of the the um, the the less of uh, two con, you know a conservative party. And I would add to that: it, not only do we have a situation where um, that party has won um, the popular vote in only six out of the last, I mean, excuse me, one out of the last seven elections. On top of which, the Senate is woefully undemocratic yeah. as well. And this is the body that confirms or uh, those those justices. I mean, woefully, yeah. um, you know, the, the Senate is controlled by uh, representatives, people who represent about 40 percent of the country. Uh, it, it's by design. Uh, but yes, that is the justification. But I think, you know, look, the bottom line is that it's not a question of like you, you don't I, I, I wouldn't even justify it in terms of the ends 
it seems to me. It needs to be justified in terms of the means. The Republicans have essentially announced that norms and whatnot are irrelevant, that the rules that are not hard and fast rules um, are optional. And if that's the case, they're optional for Republicans, they're optional for Democrats. If politics and sheer power and the ability to do something because you can do it is the principle, then it is in the best interests of the American people and the Democrats to do so. Now, and I suppose like, you know, the, the, you know, if Chuck Schumer is to do it, then they will say, uh, you know, they will make the point of like, this is a, to, to, um, this is a point. It, the, the point of this is to deal with a lack of democracy, you know, small d, um, in, in, the, in the court. But I think at the end of the day, it really is just a question of the Democrats owe it to their constituents to do this to the majority of the country to do this because it is the only way to fix a system that the Republicans broke. I I agree with you that they have to play hardball politics at every point. But I also think it's good to make the more principled point that expansion is necessary because without the consent of the governed, the Supreme Court loses legitimacy. And even more importantly, the American people did not have to accept minoritarian rule by plutocrats and right wing religious nuts. And that's what's coming without court expansion. I like it. I like it, Art. I appreciate it. Thanks oh. for the call. All right. Question. Hi, guys. I've seen it floating around. What do you think of the idea that the Democrats uh, utter malfeasance in the area of the courts? It's not just due to them being incompetent and it's not just due to them being, you know, uh, norm supporters or institutionalists or whatever, but it's also because as long as they can pretend the only way to get better justices on the court is to vote for Democrats, they can keep on using that to discipline their voters and they can keep using it to raise funds off of. Whereas if they actually fixed the courts and made them more democratic, it would be uh, less of an impetus somehow. Well, they don't have to pretend. I mean, it is the case. You're going to get better justices with Democrats than Republicans. So they're not they're not they're not they're not pretending. Well, pretending that that's the only way. Well, I mean, there is I mean, if I mean, look, you can expand the court to 13, which I think they should do. But that's not uh, any guarantee that um, the Republicans won't take, you know, won't, won't win elections and then be able to appoint people to the courts. I mean, uh, I, I I think that that like, I don't know who the brain trust is that sits around and says like, the, this is the way that we can maintain um, our, you know, uh, leverage to get people to vote for us. Or raise money. People, they, they raise money off of it a lot of the time, right? There's no doubt in my mind that that everybody in politics exploits things that happen but like I can I can assure you they weren't there was no Democrats who were like, I hope uh, Ginsburg dies before 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 um, Trump is out of office. I, I just I find that very, very hard to believe. Um, I, I think like when in Feinstein's pr uh, case, it's that she isn't sensitive to the things we care about in the courts. And that's why and that's indicative of the Democrats problem is that they just they don't care. They're not in opposition to corporate power in this way. So like a person like Feinstein, they're just not they don't understand they're even in a fight. I mean, they, they'll, their staff will take advantage of it by, you know, fundraising off it somehow. But yeah. I mean, by all accounts, Obama pressured uh, Ginsburg to and Breyer to resign. During his um, now, maybe it was just because he wanted the ability to appoint, you know, f four justices, but uh, and feel good about it. But I think it was also because they felt like there was this was a substantial risk, um, and that would cut against that theory, right? The idea that you, if you had replaced uh, Ginsburg and Breyer, um, I, I I think there's no doubt the Democrats exploit it. That's what politicians do. They exploit any opportunity. I mean, that's what I don't know. Everybody does, I think, to some extent. Um, you know, when you have a, an agenda or a goal, and you know things happen, and so you exploit it. Um, but the idea that they are that they have manufactured things in such a way 
so that the, first of all, if that was the case, then you would expect that they would be a lot better at making people appreciate the importance of the court, which they have failed dramatically at. And as far as I can tell, have expended no resources on, right? I mean, so if you were going to use the courts as leverage, you would educate the, the dupes that you were going to use the court for leverage with on the importance of the courts. And frankly, it, they're, they we're not. Democrats simply are completely far less invested. Democrats, the left, everybody who's not a Republican, far less invested in the courts uh, than the right. That's just the fact. And so if the Democrats were, were sneaky enough to say, like, we need to make sure that we're on the wrong end of where the courts lie, so as to get people to vote for us, then I would think they would also be like, hey, well, wait a second, shouldn't we also let our these these chumps know how important the court is? I mean, yeah, I feel like we get different messaging. I'm probably in a Twitter bubble because like I have gotten the sense that uh, mainstream Democrats a lot of the time use fear of like overturning Roe v. Wade to discipline their voters or to I, discipline the base. I mean, I uh, there's no doubt in my mind that 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 some people do that but i mean if that was the if 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 those mainstream democrats had the ability to manipulate the courts which is what you're suggesting right manipulate the makeup of the courts or just not do anything to fix it i don't know i just don't like the i i don't i don't i don't subscribe to this notion that there is like that there is this sort of cabal of like i don't I think it's a question of aligned interests. And like, I don't think, I mean, I don't think Obama was like, listen, guys, what we're going to do is not have any um, uh, uh, um, uh, justices or potential judges lined up so that when these vacancies are there, that we're going to be able to put them out. And I've talked to Patrick Leahy. I've told him, I want you to hold uh, the blue slips in high regard because this is going to be a long-term plan to get people to vote Democrat as opposed to like Republican. Like Patrick Leahy, like what's in it for Patrick Leahy to do that? Like, like I just don't think that like, I think that notion is to perceive, yes, people use the court as a way of disciplining voters on some level, but I, like that was my argument in 2016. It wasn't because I want to discipline voters. It was because I don't want bad outcomes to come from the court, yeah. which well, we're about to experience. And they're going to be incredibly dramatic. And, um, and, and so I, I think the idea that like Patrick Leahy was like, look, I'm playing a long game here. This is going to leverage people to vote for other Democrats. Like it's not like Patrick Leahy cares about Patrick Leahy <laughs> and he cares about getting reelected in Vermont. I don't think Patrick Leahy has like is willing to sign up for some, you know, sort of like grand scheme in which to empower Democrats that involves with, you know, the court, you know, being him being like, um, you know, giving away the court to the conservatives. It just doesn't I, I just don't think it works that way. Well, whether it's intentional or not, um, the more I learn about the Democrats' malfeasance around the courts, the angrier I get that, you know, intentionally or unintentionally, the courts are constantly being used to discipline the voters when it's time for them to ask us for something. Well, first I mean, of all, it is, it is, it's, it's, I would say it's, it's actually misfeasance rather than malfeasance. I think they're inept. And but but part of it is, and you know, I've said this almost every time that we've had a guest on to talk about this stuff. It's a failure of of the left, broadly speaking, to appreciate the importance of the courts. Because you know, this is the first time I've seen like uh, you know the groups that have arrayed against uh, um, uh, Diane Feinstein. It's the first time I've seen any squeak. Uh, from any any of these groups in regards to this, you know, whether it's NARAL or whether it's like, you know, demand progress or well, demand progress is, you know, was 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 created specifically for this. But these broader groups 
coming out and saying, hey, she's hurting us. <laughs> not yeah. just hurting it from the judicial standpoint. We're not going to stop Amy Coney Barrett. But also in terms of like, you know, Jamie Harrison running against Graham and 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 Amy Coney Barrett has a 51 percent approval rating. I mean, this is you know, part of it is, is that the the frankly, is that like the people who pay attention to politics have had no appreciation for this stuff. And, you know, uh, this, you know, the 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 specifics of the court are poo pooed. And so, like, you know, that is. Democrats I mean, have been horrible on it, but part of it is also because their voters haven't given a shit. And I mean, you have to look at the competition too, which is the right wing. We played a Huckabee clip last yeah, last week about, and the immediate thing about why you can vote for Trump as a religious person when he does all this stuff is, what well, are you going to vote for baby killers? Like yeah. that's ultimately what it is. And the left, I mean, yeah, like it's to, to we're going to have to do a, like three shows a day if we're going to... Uh, catch up to that sort of sentiment i think on well, the right. and, we, and frankly at this point there may be soon but even then there isn't a a, a a an issue that is as animating right i mean there should be there should be i mean if you care about like the power of labor you should care about it if you care about the uh ability to fight corporate power you should care about it if you care about money and politics you should care about it. if you care about a woman's sovereignty over her own body if you care about the idea that like government um can um can make sure that we have at least or attempt to have safe food safe water safe air um these are all things that the court are the court is going to inhibit our ability to do all these things all of them and then smaller things that you just don't even like that that, that you know that are there in the structure of your everyday life, but you're just not aware of. And there has been a complete, uh, in some quarters, willful ignorance, but just ge generally just ignorance. And, you know, it's like the politicians are not going to be like, I'm going to make, if, if their plan was to use this as leverage, they would make it, you know, you'd have to premise it. You'd have to build a fulcrum, right? And so, you know, the, I don't know. That perspective, I think, is is a way, honestly, like it is the, the reason why our politicians suck when it comes to the courts is because we have not demanded they're better at it. Well, not it doesn't have to be a conspiracy France. for it to function that way and work out well for them, right? I mean, I think how does what, it work out well? What, what Matt is what Matt is saying makes sense too. Right. And that the status quo is fine with a lot of these people. They're not the ones who are going to suffer and they have to do that double dance uh, like, of like, oh, well, we're we're on your the worker side, but not too much. You know, fundamentally, like all of this stuff about Democrats is an argument for them not being in opposition against Republicans. Like, I, I, I mean, y th saying that they're that they um, that they are opportunistic is very different than saying that they've create the problem so they can exploit it. No, they don't. And, 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 and also saying that, you know, someone like Dianne Feinstein doesn't uh, feel the stakes of these things. And what's really more important to her is her, you know, relationship with her fellow senators. I mean, that's what that, that, that's the conversation I had with Fallon about uh, Patrick Leahy. It was like, are you serious? Are like, are you, are you serious that it, this is really about like, you know, like, like if Fallon was talking about having, how they were going to approach Diane Feinstein, like, look at how they disrespected you and you're going to turn around and, and, and pay them that respect. Like, it's not about her. <laughs> it's like, you know, like, fine, she's been disrespected, but the idea that you need to talk to these senators on this level of like your personal respect is just, I don't know, it's bizarre to me. I mean, but frankly, you know, I, I should also say that, like, you know, we see this in the context of, of, of like the way that people talk about voting too. Like they're, they're spitting in my face. I'm not going to vote for them. Like what? They don't like, who cares? Who cares if they're spitting in your face, vote in, in the best interest of your political agenda, not because you're offended by the way that somebody's treating you and disrespecting you. It's like, I don't know. I mean, I can understand how people react that way, but it's, it's, it's it's childish. Well, I I do understand it's something like 
this area, how people might be annoyed at the Democrats failing to fix the courts for years and years and then say vote for us because of the courts. But maybe the courts are not as big a part of the discourse as I thought. How would you fix the courts before? I mean, this is not a question of like the structural changes are only in response to the fact that they have they have not been in a position to appoint these judges. Like, you know, like I, I, I can tell you this right now, I would not be calling for 13 judges yeah, maybe it would occur to me that we should have, um, you know, um, uh, term limits and whatnot, but that would not, it wouldn't be as an urgent of a call if the court was 5-4, um, you know, left-leaning versus right-leaning. I mean, before Trump won, everyone expected, I mean, everyone was looking at the courts as the place that gave us gay marriage. <laughs> I mean... And uh, and saved Obamacare ultimately, right? Like there was—I don't think there was a huge appetite for it before Trump won and right. put us behind eight ball. The, 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 it's not like these. There's no difference inherently between nine and thirteen. I mean, I think you could argue that like the court should be expanded because they have a bigger docket uh, than they did when it was nine years ago. But that's not an urgent. That's a pretty technocratic fix. It's not an urgent thing. I think. I mean, you know, probably it's more urgency for people who are working in that legal profession. But as a political matter, it's not an urgency until you get a situation where they basically um, break the rules to pack the courts and you get a 6-3 um, difference. I mean, it's, you know, like, I, I don't know, like they, you know, like if, 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 let's put it this way, if they had expanded it to 13, uh, you know, in the final year of Obama and put in like eight justices. <laughs> I mean, I guess they could have done that. Um, but the, you know, uh, McConnell would have put it, you know, would have said like, we're going to keep all those seats open. And then there, you know, it would be whatever it, it would be eight, five right now or nine, four. I mean, I, I don't know what structural reforms you're talking about that they, that were so evident, you know, that 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 they they specifically didn't do at that time i mean well, i guess it, it makes sense to leave the courts alone in like the 1960s at a time when they were making relatively progressive decisions but you know since then as the court has become more and more reactionary and they are making really bad and very very undemocratic decisions you know small d in terms of just where society's at um, it, it makes sense to try to delegitimize and reduce the power of the court. Like that's really the only route I see right here. Um, I can tell you this, that there was an attempt by the Republicans in, I don't know, 2010, something like that, uh, to make the DC circuit court smaller by and maybe this happened during the Bush years. I can't, for the life of me, I can't remember exactly. But the D.C. Circuit Court is the second most important court in the country. It is where um, all of these administrative questions about the power of agencies to regulate corporations comes up. It's where a lot of the stuff in Dodd-Frank, um, you know, would have been challenged. And the Republicans had successfully blocked any appointees to that court and said, you don't need to have a full complement of 11 justices. I can't remember the details. Maybe it was a, they had eight or, or nine. And um, that's what I think, if I remember correctly, uh, got Harry Reid to um, push for the, the removal of the filibuster for federal judiciary picks so that they could put a full complement of, of uh, judges on the DC circuit court. And so from a, from a, you know, in terms of the theory that, that the, the Democrats were doing that, I mean, that, that runs contrary to it. Um, so I don't know. I think that what has to happen is uh, people have to accept that you vote for a Republican the just the ju you know the the judiciary is going to be dominated by by conservatives <laughs> you know like you can come up with like you know some type of machination that the democrats you know are playing some type of like 12 dimensional chest here you know so that they can win the next election after they lose this one 
But the fact of the matter is, is that accept it. You vote for a Republican, you're going to get conservative, uh, extremely conservative justices. You withhold your vote from uh, the, you know, Joe Biden in this instance, you are by a half a vote. That's what you are attesting to do uh, by a half a vote. You are increasing the chance, the likelihood of more conservative justices. I mean, that's just, that's, that is, everything else is just some type of like, I don't know, rationalization. Um, And also like, I think the intentionality here is kind of beside the point. I think the more important point is this is all an argument for not trusting Democrats in opposition. You're not rewarding them with power. That's a secondary thing. But as these four years have demonstrated, they can't be trusted to oppose a Republican agenda. And, you know, I am almost 100% sure that in my argument with Jimmy Dore, I was I was saying that. That, that Democrats are weak in opposition. And so we know how they're going to react to these things. And he was like, well, you're saying Democrats are weak. Yeah, they are. Yeah. Like, I don't, I don't, like, you know, the idea of like, I don't care if the Democrats, you know, feed me with a, uh, you know, uh, feed me with a, the silver spoon or they spit in my face. I don't care. I don't have a relationship to them like that. I, like, you know, like my ego is not involved in it one way or another. It is what is the thing we all have an infinitesimally small, you need a microscope for it, amount of power uh, in the context of, of elections. We may have slightly more in the context of other things that we can do in protesting. We may even have more in terms of like withholding our labor. But in the context of an election, we have an a a microscope level amount of power. And the question is, is how are you going to expend it? Period. End of story. Are you going to expend it? And, and, and if your theory is, and then it's just a question of like, what's your theory of, 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 of change that is going to result from the, the expending of that power? And I mean, and then everything just accrues from that. If you have a theory that, you know, uh, I'm going to vote this way because it's going to cause people to do that thing. I mean, at least it's a theory. But the idea that, like, you know, I'm going to blame the Democrats for leveraging the loss of the Supreme Court uh, because it makes me believe that maybe they did this on purpose. It's just like it, it's I mean, first of all, they're not that competent. But second of all, it's like it's just they're being opportunistic. But again, that doesn't in any way have anything to do with your relationship and what the courts are going to decide. You know, you still got to do the thing that you want to get the outcomes you want. And so, I don't know. Uh, This is interesting and to be expected. This is from Huffington Post. Um, These are people uh, who are being interviewed by some folks from Huffington Post in Pennsylvania who have flipped their votes. They went from Obama to Trump and now are going to Biden. Listen to this. I think it's it's sort of intuitive, uh, not to be unexpected, but uh, here it is. I'm talking to Michael Scott and Lee Kaczynski, <laughs> who both are food service workers. And you voted for Trump in 16, and you're voting for Biden this time. Correct. Why did you switch? I was fine with Trump until he got on TV with the coronavirus. And the whole way he just handled that whole situation turned me off. So this year, he's my man this time. Pretty much the same. Dishonesty. Dishonesty. Yep. And just the way he talks about our military, things like that, and even the way when once he got the virus and the way he acted afterwards. I mean, this is the most important thing we can do right now is to protect you and me and him. And he's not for it. And I'm afraid this virus is only going to keep going as long as he's in office. What do you think of uh, of Biden as a person? 
compassionate. Very compassionate. I think he's a people person. I really I think he's here for us. What did you see in Trump the first time? I felt that it was something new. He was a businessman. And if a businessman can run a business, why couldn't he run our government? And, and, and were you, uh, did you, who'd you vote for in 2012? Obama. Obama. Yeah. Obama. He's just looking for a change, but that change wasn't a good change. Not at all. Which change was not a good change? When I went for Trump. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was a big mistake. I mean, I, I, you know, it's hard to know how representative that is, but the data shows that that Biden's doing much better with older folks. And, and those folks look to me to be, you know, late 50s, maybe 60s. Um, and partly, you know, it's because of the coronavirus, it seems to me. Uh, but this idea that Joe Biden's just, you know, he's just a guy, seems like he's like a, I mean, it's hard to imagine a politician not coming across as compassionate relative to Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. But, um, and I don't know. I mean, I, who knows? If, it, if, if we were not in the middle of a pandemic, I think that would we, we you know, we, we could be in some trouble if Joe Biden was the nominee, but there's no point in, in trying to go back at this point. Yeah. But, I mean, as to them saying, you know, they just now realize Trump's a liar. I think, you know, obviously there's some incredulity there, but they are kind of victims of American culture, right? Like that generation of people was so primed for the businessman in office. And Trump was the businessman on TV and like in all of culture, not just NBC, but like if you search him in rap genius, he comes up in so many shows just as a synonym for rich guy. And then if you, and like people don't pay attention that much to this stuff. So they, that's the impression they got of him. Not like this insane, like, you know, right wing, uh, lunatic because I mean, yeah, it's like, it's kind of really understandable how this happened. And, and re remember now we're talking about a relatively small cohort of people, you know, I don't know, maybe, maybe 6 million, 8 million people who, you know, these people represent on some level and they don't necessarily represent them, but are, are part of that cohort. And, you know, that's also does not fit necessarily the sort of like the ideological story. You know, maybe it, it, I think it is. It's the businessman thing. Yeah. And no one who's driven by ideology is going to swing back and forth between Trump and the Democrats. I mean, I, I but I mean, like the idea that he was, you know, that people were were it, it was his populism that that drove people from, uh, you know, like Clinton to to Trump. I think it was more either an intent populism is not necessarily that ideological. Right. Well, I mean, the the uh, the economic populism, I mean, I think there were definitely some uh, some some voters who might have. But I feel like it was overstated. He I, won the primary with the right wing stuff and the general with, you know, stuff we're talking about, the businessman well, stuff. Right. And I think I think um, I, I think, you know, like Clinton was disliked for myriad reasons, including. All, all the things that we talk about and uh, including, you know, a healthy dose of misogyny. <laughs> we read that story from the New York times the other day. Uh, I don't mean to laugh about it, but I mean, it's quite obvious. Uh, but I also think that there is this notion of like uh businessman is, you know, we, this country is, you are indoctrinated to believe that businessmen are, you know, that money is a, um, is a moral attribute and that if you have money, then you are morally and sort of just divinely superior, uh, then, and that, and that you like have business acumen, right? That there's like not a huge amount of luck or in Donald Trump's case, like seed money that, that, uh, brought you to a certain point. Um, you know, and it's also, I don't know, I mean, it, 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 and, and, and you're talking, again, a narrow set of people. And so, I don't know, uh, we'll, we'll see, see what these numbers say. But uh, meanwhile, there are a lot of people voting, and uh, there's data out that shows that black people 
brown people, when they wait in line for, to vote, they're waiting 10, 20, 40, 50% longer in line than white people are generally because there's less uh, voting booths, less staff in their in the areas in which they vote. Here's Mike Huckabee trying to spin the fact that our voting system is so disjointed, so filled with holes, in many respects, so under attack by uh, Republicans. Here he is trying to spin it as if this is a, this is a positive. 36 million people voted already, Governor Huckabee, and people think automatically that that's good for Democrats. I think it's good for America. What about you? Yeah, I think it is, too. It shows an extraordinary interest. When people are lined up to vote, it means that they really care. They don't drive by and say, ah, long line, forget about it. They get in that line and they wait an hour and a half and they, they cast their vote. Uh, it, it shows the passion of the American people. In these final days, what the president has to do is forget about Hunter Biden, forget about all the distractions of everything except one thing. Remind the American people that it is their lives that it's that really uh, on the on the mark right now. But it's Governor, what Governor he's leading with Hunter Biden. Is that a mistake? Yeah, it is a mistake because the average person <laughs> doesn't understand it. It's too complicated. Right. And frankly, it doesn't matter to them. They care about their health care costs. They care about their taxes. They care about safety in their neighborhood, on their block and in their yard. Focus on that. He wins the election by a landslide. Mm, I don't think so. But the idea is that actually people do not just drive by, people walk by or people see it and say, I can't take an hour and a half or two hours from work. I don't have the ability to do that. And so they don't go and vote. And he knows it. But like, you know, celebrating the fact that there's hour and a half, two hour, six hour lines to vote is like, you know, that story of like uniquely American. Two jobs. You remember that clip from George Bush where the woman says, like, oh I'm God. working two jobs and I'm working like 17 hours a day. Uniquely American. Ugh, that sucks so much. So much. Like that is something that is not something to be celebrated. People should not have to have intestinal fortitude and the ability to sort of like threaten their income, uh, their jobs uh, or have to hire babysitters for hours on end to go vote. That is a flaw. That is not something to be celebrated in any shape or form. I mean, it is uniquely American, but not in the way that he wants it to be. Yeah, exactly. If you want, if you want, if you want, you, if you want to celebrate something, give Americans uh, the, the extra time so that they can, you know, I don't know, contribute to their community or spend with their families or I don't know, go, enrich their lives in some way. That's what we should be celebrating. Not that they, yeah, two hours to go vote. That's uh, that's what we want for America. I mean, it's psycho because I think George Bush honestly meant that. And he comes from a family that should be conscious about how they have been keeping people in that state. They've been at the levers of power way back, right? This is a conscious choice. Yeah, well, they're they're really impressed with other people working hard. Uh, Doug Simmons on the IM breakthrough. You use Myriad correctly. My work here is done. Yes, I think uh, I, Doug sent me an email saying that I'm using Myriad incorrectly. So I made my best attempt to uh, use it correctly today. I'm very, very, very proud of myself. Uniquely American. Um, should we do the uh, Chris James prank? Oh, yeah, if you should. Okay. It's funny, it's funny how many of these don't get picked up as Chris James pranks, because uh, this one didn't. It's not framed as such. I only know because I watch his show. Is, it, is Did he do it or did he tell no, someone, it's, someone the joke? He has, you know, he does a lot of the pranks himself, but he has a group of people that call him with him and sort of like fill up the entire phone lines. This is um, uh, Chris James from Not Even a Show. He's, it's not him, but it is uh, his legion. Yes? Yes. I'm uh, immensely um, oh, grateful to you for everything you've done in British politics over the last few years. Nigel Farage, and he's on um, uh, 
Uh, Leading Britain's Conversation, a show he had on that network. Yeah, here we go. I'm uh, immensely um, grateful to you for everything you've done in British politics over the last few years. Uh, I used to be a an ardent Remain. I voted Remain. I believed in the European project. Mm-hmm. Uh, I believed that staying in the European Union was the best thing for us. And then something happened and something monumental happened. I, it completely changed my, my opinion on, on the, the whole situation. What, uh, what was that monumental thing, Mark? I, I was kicked in the head by a horse. <laughs> right, very good. OK. Oh, OK. How do we know that it's a uh, um, uh, not-even-show listener? Uh, I'm almost certain I saw them clip it on an episode of Not Even the Show on YouTube. That's that's funny. <laughs> He's very good at his scripts are so good because he lead he handholds them all the way to where they want to go and then just completely. It's crack, yeah, crack it's like baiting them. the hook and like letting it set and then then you yank it. Mm-hmm. Hey, lastly, we should probably um, uh, this is to be the last thing. Um. um I'm sorry, folks. We're running out of time. I uh, don't have time for any calls. Sorry, people. Have been hanging on. We'll, we'll, we'll try tomorrow. Um, Rush Limbaugh, ladies and gentlemen, who um, has been um, foisting conspiracy theories on this country, has been, in many respects, poisoning the the minds of Americans. He has been the intellectual pillar of the Republican Party for at least multiple decades now. Uh, his message of feel no um, no pangs of conscience when you see other people suffering, um, when you, you should view uh, women who are attempting to uh, lead lives independent of, of subjugation by men as uh, suspicious and, in fact, like fascists. Um, not oh, the, he did say that, didn't he? Well, feminazi was his, uh, his coinage. Um, you should, um, you should uh, view uh, people of color with suspicion, um, or at least uh, their, their motives often. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Sadly, um, he is uh, announcing that uh, his cancer has uh, returned. Here he is. It's it's tough to realize that the days where I do not think I'm under a death sentence are over. Now we all are. Is the point? We all know that we're going to die at some point. But when you have a terminal disease diagnosis that has a time frame to it, then that puts a different a different psychological and, and even physical awareness to it. So last week was treatment week. Was it last week was treatment week? The week before. Week before was treatment week. Uh, there he is. Um... He is uh, he's announcing that uh, his cancer has returned and that it um, he is on the clock, as it were. Um, one would hope that it would make him uh, look back on his life and have a moment where he realizes, like, I have been um, I have been a force in this country for now multiple decades uh, that has been corrosive and disempowering for the people who listen to my show and uh, other people uh, across the the board. Uh, but I don't think that's going to happen. Um, I think cancer is bad in general, and um, and let's not generalize. Well, I think cancer is not a good thing. Let's put it that way. I think cancer is not a good thing, but I also think case Rush, by case basis. But I also think Rush Limbaugh is not a good thing. So it's sort of like you know one of these things. Like I don't want, um, I don't want cancer to be around. But like, I'm also not so excited to have Rush Limbaugh around. So unstoppable force meets immovable object. No, it's 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 tough. It's tough. Um, 
But uh, there is like, you know, I think this is all part of the generational thing. You know, uh, there is a season and to everything uh, there's, there's the season. And so uh, some seasons um, change. And so. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I'm not going to say anything else about this because I feel like I'm going to get myself in trouble. Yeah, I mean, look, I think people know that I, my feeling is this, broadly speaking. I don't, I, I don't know. Rush Limbaugh could be a good husband. I mean, he's had a lot of practice at it. I think he's actually had three marriages. Uh, he could be, uh, I don't know if he's a good father. I don't think he has any children. Maybe he does. I don't know. Uh, maybe he's a, a good brother or a good son or a cousin or whatever it is. I don't know him in that capacity. I only know him as a very malignant force in this country for decades and as a liar and as um, someone who wouldn't take responsibility for what he did by, I'm just an entertainer. Um, and so I think the world would be a better place without him on a microphone talking to Americans. Now, if he were to resign and quit right now, then, you know, I would never talk about him again, probably. Uh, so whatever gets him off the air, I think is a good thing, net positive. So let's leave it with that. Fair enough. All right. I just wish to everybody who uh who dies in this country partly as often as a result of republican policies had access to the kind of cushy care and the drugs and everything that he's getting because right it's it's too good for him that's true too that's true too all right um a couple of ims and we'll get out of here jeez i'm sorry folks so late p word if you ain't voting for biden you're you're not an anti-fascist jack also, MR Among Us a game would be so fun. Oh, holy crap, have you heard of this Giuliani scene in the Borat film? <laughs> yeah, we talked about that. Uh, Sam, lots of scare about the backdrops in your studio. I'd like to tap you into the broader cultural context. Oh yeah, we did the Mondrian thing. Uh, did that. Uh, the existence of these transitions to the fun half, a reminder how amazing the majority report community is. I'm another anal analyst from 908, got some COVID, but then piggy off of John, but, but in the lay analyst view of the electoral stuff, Mark Cuban's going to be Senator of Texas, 2024. Hmm. DV, DMV Mike uh, did that. Uh, did that. Uh, hey, Sam, I wrote in two weeks ago about how the Golden Dawn ban out of, in Greece highlighted how our stupid our First Amendment is, specifically that GOP has deep, provable ties with right-wing groups that caused actionable harm, and yet you could never get a political party here banned. Matt seemed to have a reflexive aversion to my statement. I don't think we should fetishize the First Amendment. There are, certain, there are highly functional nations which limit certain kinds of speech. We are seeing the First Amendment here being used to roll back various rights and protections. I agree with you not fetishizing it. I am not a uh, First Amendment um, maximum. absolutist. Absolutist, I am not, um, and we have we have restricting principles on it, right? Like you can't yell fire in a crowded theater, and that principle, I think, you know, yelling fire is a you know, it's a lot more discernible than saying like, are you saying something that is actually going to have detrimental impact on on society? I do think we have a problem, though, uh, with the First Amendment being used to roll back things like, uh, um, you know, workplace regulations and uh, protections for citizens and consumers and for uh, workers. Um, and I don't know if I would go so far as uh, outlying um, political parties. Well, I will say is I, I just did an episode on the Golden Dawn, so I feel like I know something about it. It's not quite analogous to the far right groups that Republicans have ties to in this country. Um, the, 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 the far right groups who would cause violence on the streets are a, a few layers removed from the Republican Party, whereas in Greece, it's the members of the Golden Dawn themselves who are going around stabbing people. No, I mean, it, I don't know what, what happened to McConnell's hands. What was he up to? Mm, that is weird stuff. All right. 
Uh, New York, Kate Upstate. How is Guy Lawson? Would like to hear him on a, a show soon. Yeah, we got to do that. Binder Dad, I received my first order from Sunset Lake recently. Although my order was in my actual name, this handwritten note was at the bottom of my packing slip. Whoa, Binder Dad, I'd like to send some gummies on us. Enjoy. Now that's about as good as getting a show far from Santa. I'm guessing they watch Doomed as well as MR because I used my name in that live chat. Uh, Dovered, can I get unbanned from Twitch? Username Nug Wrangler. I don't know why I got banned. Um, also, Pac-Man does it. You know, get a subscribe button on Twitch. Yeah, we should do that. Would you agree that the Ralph Nader 2000 run showed establishment Dems don't listen to progressives that abstain from voting or th vote third party? They vilified him after the run rather than try to court his base. Why try to abstain again? Yeah, there's, I, I, I yes, that's an example of it not working. Um, 2016 was an example of it not working. That theory of change has been proven to fail um, at least multiple times in my lifetime. Uh, Aaron from Montario, your stiff collared shirt is dangerously close to being a soft collared shirt. Isn't Friday? Jeez, it's not. It is, it is not a soft collar. Uh, Medicare for more, please. Uh, along with the other new Voting Rights Act thing that needs to be done, I am adding and hope you amplify ranked choice voting as an aspect that should be required of all federal offices. Yes, I like that monk from Lewis. John uh, from San Antonio likes Michael McDonald, the Doobie Brothers, Sweet Freedom. Um, all else. So now AOC and uh, Omar have gone and played Among Us to Twitch the thousands, uh, hundreds of thousands of views. How long until we see a Twitch stream of you versus Chuck Schumer in Mortal Kombat? I wish. Kowloon Sammy, for context, my uh, I was in environmental econ class today and we focused on the election. Well, nearly everyone said they were voting for Biden. There are a few who said they weren't voting at all. The overwhelming consensus was the Democratic Party isn't up to the task of tackling climate change. Seems like this moment is radicalizing a lot of young people, even in econ departments. Yes, and I'm I'm afraid, you know, they're right, but I think there's more of an opportunity to push them. Um, please challenge Chuck Schumer, says really cool. Chris from Taiwan, have there been any polls of Paula Jean Swergen in Virginia or West Virginia or Margarita Bradshaw in Tennessee? I haven't seen any. Classical Liberace was hoping you could explain why Trump and Republicans decided to deploy the stupid strategy for re-election when they offered literally nothing to the public. It seems to me that something as simple as a monthly 1200 that expired on January 1, 2021 would have helped them. Well, yeah, Trump wants to do that, but only that. And I think that's why um, uh, Pelosi's holding the line. Quinn from Minneapolis, AOC, uh, right? Got that. And the final I am of the day, and this is for, I guess, I know we had other people. After a few weeks in surgery at the NICU, my newborn son is healthy and home. Can I request a shofar for our newest comrade, baby Sam? Aww. Yes, you can. I'll give you another one for that. Matt, Jamie, Brendan, great show. I'm so happy that your, your child is healthy and home. Uh, and this is for everybody else who requested a shofar today. See you tomorrow. It might take all the strength I got To get to where I want But I know somehow I'm gonna get there I wasn't looking when I just got caught But see the truth